Okay, live stream is up. Sergeant Hope, if you can start the PC recording. PC recording rolling. Cloud is rolling. Backup is rolling. Thank you. Sergeant Leonardo, you may take it away with the opening. Live streaming is up. You may begin. Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Transportation. At this time, would all panelists please turn on your video. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices to vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chair Rodriguez, we are ready to begin. Thank you, Sergeant. Hello and good morning. Thank you all for joining the Committee of Transportations of a site hearing focusing on the MTA in the era of COVID-19. First, I'm going to turn it over to the to our committee council and moderator to go over some procedure items. Thank you, Chair. I'm Elliot Lynn, counsel to the Transportation Committee of the New York City Council. Before we begin, I just want to remind everyone that you'll be on mute until you're called on to testify, at which time you'll be unmuted by the host. Please listen for your name to be called. I will periodically announce who the next panelist will be. The first panelist will be from the MTA, Chairman and CEO Pat Foy, Chief Financial Officer Bob Ferran, and Interim President of New York City Transit, Sarah Feinberg. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and the chair or I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes. Please also note that for ease of this virtual hearing, we will not be allowing a second round of questioning. Thank you. Uh, chair Rodriguez. Thank you, Elliot. Uh, I would like now to turn it over to our council speaker, Corey Johnson, for his opening remarks. Uh, good morning. Thank you all for being here today. And I want to thank you, Chair Rodriguez, for holding this hearing. Uh, before I get into my remarks, I want to say that I think we've been joined by Council Members Ku, uh, Lander, Cabrera, Holden, Menchaca, Council Member Diaz, and I apologize, uh, Council Member Rose as well. Uh, <clears throat> good morning. Thank you all for being here. I want to start off by recognizing the MTA workers who have kept this city moving under unimaginable circumstances, never once letting the system fully shut down, but it has not come without a cost. We have lost 136 transit workers due to COVID-19. 136. I want to take a moment of silence for all of them and their dedication to our city. Thank you. I'm glad to see that we have a great lineup today from the MTA, uh, Pat Foy, Sarah Feinberg, and Bob Ferran. <clears throat> Pat, I know your schedule uh, must be crazy these days. I know you've been working with the unions, the agency presidents, <clears throat> excuse me, and the board and uh, getting money from the federal government. Uh, you have done some incredible work under some of the most difficult circumstances in the history of the agency. I, I do of course have some policy disagreements with the MTA and we will get to those, but when, I wanna start off by saying a thank you. Thank you to your team. Thank you to all the workers at the MTA who have done so much during these difficult times. We appreciate all the work that has been done. And I think it's really a testament uh, to the commitment, your commitment to public service uh, that you all have stuck this out uh, in your positions during this pandemic. Having stability and institutional knowledge during a crisis is really invaluable. I think it's made a real difference for riders and with MTA employees. And I know these jobs aren't easy, <clears throat> even in the best of times. So we owe everyone at the MTA who has stuck through this a debt of gratitude. The last time the MTA was here for an oversight hearing, we talked about the new capital plan, how expansive, uh, how an expansive 24-7 subway system is 
to the drive to the uh, is the driver of our economy, how it's critical to New York's status as the greatest city in the world, and how if it fails, so does New York. I know we're in the midst of an enormous crisis, hopefully the worst any of us will ever experience. At every level of government, we have had to make difficult, painful choices. So I can understand why service was limited back in March, but a lot has changed since then. We know much more about how the virus is transmitted. We've lifted many of the lockdown restrictions that we had in the spring. We've vaccinated hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers, but as the rest of the city is moving forward and starting our recovery, we wanna make sure that the MTA is doing the same. I, I wanna make sure that we're not compounding the inequities that made this pandemic so devastating to New York City, proposing fare hikes and service cuts, keeping the subway system closed overnight. Those are not solutions to our problems. They will make it harder for us to recover. And if the city doesn't bounce back, this MTA's finances will only get worse. We need to be able to show residents and businesses and tourists that we are back. We need the tax dollars that come from having a fully functioning economy. The survival of the MTA depends on it. So I am a little frustrated that our recovery has been hobbled a bit uh, by us wanting to get the MTA up and running in a full force way. We are asking businesses to stay uh, in New York to keep their doors open, uh, but we are forcing many of our most vulnerable workers to spend hours a day finding alternative transportation. We have 24 hour vaccination sites in New York City, but we do not have 24 hour subway service for the noble purpose that some would say, uh, some are saying is forcing the homeless out into the cold night after night I think you all know that my preference is eventually to have the city take the subway system back, to have the city run the subways and buses again. I know that it is a much taller order now with our current financial picture. But the fact that we as a city are at odds uh, with uh, an agency that serves millions of New Yorkers every day on such an important policy matter and is a key tool to our recovery. I don't know how we can continue down the same road. Of course, once again, the city is going to be asked to open up our, to open up our wallet as we should, but we wanna make sure that we have meaningful ability to influence the way the MTA operates, its plans and its budget. I wanna be optimistic about New York's future. I am optimistic. I wanna believe that we will bounce back from this and be better than ever, and I believe we will, but we need to make sure that the MTA is a meaningful partner in this. We are in for some dark days ahead and we wanna make sure that we are partnered together to get it done. So again, I wanna thank you all for being here. I wanna thank all of the workers at the MTA for the job they have done during these difficult days. I wanna thank you, Pat and Sarah and Bob for I know a really, really difficult year under uh, tremendously difficult circumstances. And I appreciate you being here this morning to talk about the MTA. Uh, and its recovery during this time of COVID. Uh, I have some questions uh, about congestion pricing, about 24 seven service, about homeless New Yorkers and about the capital plan that I'll get into later. But with that, I wanna turn it back over to Chair Rodriguez for his opening statement. Thank you again for being here today. Thank you, Speaker, for your support and the committee that I have the honor to serve under your leadership and for all the contribution that you made in our city. Good morning, everyone. Today, the Committee on Transportation convened remotely to hold this very important oversight hearing on the MTA. Before I begin, I would like to extend my thanks and appreciation, as the speaker said, to all of the MTA employees that kept our transit system running during one of the worst pandemic that our city and our nation and the world has ever experienced. To the families of the MTA's employees who lost employees who lost the battle against COVID-19, I extend my sincere condolences. Their sacrifice will never be forgotten. Additionally, I would like to welcome Kemuel Arroyo. I know that he will play an important role as the MTA Chief Accessibility Officer 
together with the chair of the MTA, Pafoy, I know they will work hard together with all of us to make our all train stations in New York City accessible. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, average New York City Transit weekday ridership reached more than 7 million riders. And it was one of the few public transportation systems in the world that run 24 hours per day on every day of the year. Stay at home orders across the three state area led to a steep ridership declines of as much as 19% at one point on the New York City transit system, the Long Island Railroad and the Metro North Railroad. Recent statistics from the MTA show that ridership is still down across its transit systems. A recent report Project that, MT, project that the MTA ridership may not reach 80% of its pre-pandemic levels again, at least until year 2024. The impact that the COVID-19 pandemic has had on the operations and budget of the MTA has been harsh and alarming. The COVID-19 pandemic also led the MTA to shut down overnight subway service in the city between 1 a.m. and 5 a.m. based on their argument to clean and disinfect trains, equipment, and a station. This shutdown impact predominant, predominantly low-income immigrant workers who did not have the luxury of working from home. They didn't have the luxury to go and relocate themselves in the Hampton of the Hobson Valley, as some people did. It is my hope that during today's hearing, the MTA will give us an update as to when overnight subway service will be fully restored in the city, seeing as yet they have not given us a timeline for restoration. And to say that the train will continue being shut down during the, and until we are dealing with the pandemic is unacceptable. The COVID-19 pandemic and ensuring decline in ridership also had a major impact on the MTA's budget. Even with the federal aid that they received last year, the MTA faced significant out-year budget deficits. Without further support from the state and federal government, the MTA may be forced to further increase fare institute a step cut to service or eliminate jobs. This scenario is unacceptable. And I implore our state and federal officials to provide this much needed financial relief so that our public transit system can continue to efficiently serve the transit riders in our city, in our state. And as everyone knows, this larger public transportation system is important to the economy of the whole nation. But everyone knows that many of the riders are working class, immigrants, New Yorkers, visitors. The federal government must also act quickly to improve congestion pricing, a crucial source of revenue for the capital plan. Today, I would also like to hear what the MTA is doing to increase safety in our subway system particularly during COVID-19 pandemic, as there have been a recent increase in incidents against transit riders and workers. We also hope that the MTA is able to discuss some details in the core status regarding the council zoning for transit accessibility proposals. Finally, I would like to hear how the MTA is working with other city agencies to hold to serve our homeless population and how transitioning from using the NYPD to utilizing social workers in the subway can ensure that our most vulnerable New Yorkers are receiving the support they need. Being poor is not a crime. It is a social and societal problem and we, not, we cannot criminalize the homeless at a time when many New Yorkers are going through economic crisis. It was disheartening to hear a report 
that one of the way the MTA tried to solve the only crisis in our city was by removing benches from subway station platform. It was completely unacceptable that the MTA removed the benches from the train station. I hope and I know that with the leadership with Pafoy, those benches should be restored and we should have a clear explanation why that happened. Over 1 million New Yorkers who have disability and other physical challenges need this spot to be able to rest. So they are not important only for the homeless population. They are important to 1 million New Yorkers with physical challenges and many other who are visited in our city. The MTA had to work alongside city agencies to connect homeless individuals with safe housing rather than kicking them out of our subways and leaving them outside in the freezing cold. I hope the authority will address this in the testimony today. Before we hear from the MTA, I will now have our moderator and committee council recognize members that are in attendance with us today and to administer the oath to the officials that are here to testify. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I will now call on the following panelists to testify. Pat Foy, Bob Ferran, and Sarah Feinberg. I will now read the affirmation and then I will call on each of you to confirm your response aloud for the record. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Chairman Foy? Yes. Mr. Ferran? Yes. President Feinberg? Yes. Thank you. You may begin your testimony when ready. Uh, Speaker Johnson, Chair Rodriguez, good morning. Uh, thank you for inviting us today. Uh, I'm Pat Foy, MTA Chairman and CEO. I'm joined by my colleagues, Bob Foran, Chief Financial Officer of the MTA, and Sarah Feinberg, Interim President of New York City Transit. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to thank Speaker Johnson and Chair Rodriguez, both for the invitation and for their advocacy on behalf of the MTA. I also want to thank uh, Speaker Johnson personally for his introduction to the newly confirmed Secretary of Transportation. And Chair Rodriguez, your regular appearances at our board meetings and repeated calls for federal funding are much appreciated. Since we last appeared before the Council in May of 2020 at the height of the pandemic, much has changed. The COVID-19 virus has wreaked havoc on our agency on both a personal and financial level. Its impact on our budget surpasses that of even the Great Depression, and the all-too-real human cost has been steep. To date, we tragically lost more than 140 of our colleagues. We will never forget their service and dedication, and the heroism that every transit worker at subways, buses, paratransit, Staten Island Rail, Long Island Railroad, Metro North, uh, and bridges and tunnels has in carrying New York City and the region throughout the pandemic. Despite these immense challenges, the hardworking and heroic MTA workforce has kept the city moving for essential workers and first responders during the height of the crisis and now during the recovery. All the while, our agencies have continued to show improvements in on-time performance and other metrics, with 88.6% of subway trains operating on time last year the highest on-time performance in recent history. On buses, the average extra time customers sent ab aboard decreased by 46 seconds on a 12-month average basis. And the equivalent metric measuring on-time performance increased by five percentage points to over 77%. This pro progress was greatly helped by the city's installation of over 16 new, 16 new miles of bus lanes and bus wheels. We're buoyed by the success and hope to see New York City Department of Transportation implement the rest of the 60 miles of bus lanes that Sarah Feinberg requested for the past summer. I have spoken with Commissioner Hank Gutman, who I've known for a long time, and we all look forward to working with him and his team on this and other matters. For our part, we're doing everything we can to maintain and expand on these improvements and performance while prioritizing safety of our customers and employees at every turn. Throughout this once in a hundred year crisis, the MTA has been an industry leader in pandemic protocols, 
working in lockstep with top federal, state, and local authorities to adopt our response, adapt our response, and protect customers and our dedicated employees. That starts with our universal mask mandate launched back in April and our unparalleled round-the-clock disinfecting program, which 70, over 75% of riders, riders surveyed said they strongly approve in a recent customer survey. Complementing these efforts are innovative new pilots and studies in fields ranging from air filtration systems to understanding the fluid dynamics of aerosols. We've empowered riders by providing real-time capacity tracking on buses and the commuter rails to help promote social distancing. PPE, personal protective equipment vending machines have been installed at select stations along with mass dispensers on buses and hand sanitizer pumps system-wide. And we created the regional mask force, distributing more than 6 million masks to customers who need them. Many of you and your colleagues have joined us for mass force events, and we graciously, grace, greatly appreciate your support, especially Speaker Johnson, Chair Rodriguez, Council Member Miller, and Council Member Levin. When it comes to managing the spread of COVID-19 among our workforce, we were the first transit agency in the nation to stand up our own on-site testing program. And now we're looking to expand it with coronavirus vaccines. But like the rest of the nation, the MTA is severely limited by the constrained levels of available vaccines. We wanna get as many of our workers inoculated as possible, especially our women and men on the front lines. However, availability of supplies from the federal government must improve first. The efforts of our heroic workers demand nothing less. In the meantime, safety remains our number one priority as we continue taking action to protect the health and well being of our customers and workforce. We're also focused on ensuring security of our system. Most concerningly, in recent weeks, we have seen a string of high profile attacks on customers and members of our workforce. This is appalling and unacceptable. The MTA is already proposing to strengthen state laws protecting employees against spitting and other incidents and assaults. But what we really need is additional robust support from our partners at the NYPD and additional mental health resources from the city of New York. We have been in close contact with the new Transit Bureau Chief Kathleen O'Reilly and are encouraged by her commitment to address these issues and increase police presence across the system. The bottom line is we need customers to feel safe throughout the system so that they will return as the city reopens. The MTA's finances will not be able to recover without them. Before COVID, fair revenue generated fully $6 billion for our operations. Our ridership declines over the past 11 months are well documented. Today, we're serving roughly 30% of our pre-COVID customer base on the subways and approximately 50% on buses. Never in the MTA's history, including the Great Depression, have we ever experienced such a sustained drop in ridership and subsequent fare revenue on which we depend. With no option for operating relief from the city and state, which are also struggling financially, we've had to rely on the federal government to stay afloat. The MTA received roughly $8 billion in emergency aid last year between the CARES Act in March and the latest COVID relief bill passed in December. Additionally, additionally we were in December able to borrow another $2.9 billion through the Federal Reserve's Municipal Liquidity Facility. These funds have been a critical lifeline for the MTA and will help us get through 2021 while avoiding severe budget-driven cuts to service and thousands of layoffs. We're grateful to Senate Majority Leader Schumer, Speaker Pelosi, and the bipartisan New York delegation for their hard work and support. But to be clear, we're not out of the woods yet. We are still forecasting substantial out-year deficits through 2024. At our board meeting later this month, we will consider toll policy proposals after deciding in January to delay a scheduled vote on fare increases. We recognize that so many of our customers are suffering financially as a result of the pandemic, 
and we do not want to exacerbate the economic impact of this crisis, especially for essential workers, low-income residents, and communities of color that rely on us. Without question, it's the right thing to do, but those actions will have an impact on our already extremely fragile budget. Internally, we have undertaken our own extensive cost-cutting measures. We are, we are projected to save an additional $601 million in 2021 through significant reductions in overtime, major cuts in the use of consultants, and other non-personnel expense reductions. But it's a fraction of what is needed to address the lingering impact of the pandemic. Simply put, we will need a billions more in additional federal relief to get us through the next few years. Thankfully, there is reason to be optimistic on that front. Recent reports indicate that Senator Schumer expects that the next COVID relief package will include at least $30 billion for mass transit nationally, with a significant amount earmarked for the MTA. We're looking forward to continuing to work with him, Speaker Pelosi, newly confirmed Transportation Secretary Buttigieg, and the Biden administration to protect the MTA. We have long said that this is a national crisis that requires a national solution. Beyond covering operating costs, federal support can help fund transformative and necessary capital projects that will strengthen our system for decades to come, like those outlined in our historic 2020 to 24 capital program. The installation of modern signaling on six subway lines, 70 new ADA accessible stations, Eastside access, Penn Station access, and Second Avenue subway phase two. But the capital plan has been largely put on hold as a result of the pandemic and the resulting financial crisis. The Biden administration, the transit friendly Biden administration can help us recover by accelerating the central business district tolling program, which was needlessly and cynically delayed by the prior administration. The Central Business District Tolling Program will help us leverage $15 billion for our five-year capital plan. In addition, Governor Cuomo followed through on the state's commitment by including a $3 billion capital contribution to our capital plan in this year's state budget proposal. We hope and expect that the City of New York will definitively confirm its $3 billion share. These commitments together represent from the state and city represent approximately 12% of the 2020 to 24 capital program and will fund key projects I just mentioned and others I mentioned a moment ago. We are eager to pursue these critical projects for our city customers as soon as possible. One thing we know is that when, well, when we get, we will get past this global public health crisis and it's important that when we do, our system is not in a state of disrepair. It's why it's so important that the city serve as our partner and meet its commitment towards the capital plan. Over the last year, MTA construction and development has proven that it can advance key projects with the new funding constraints, thanks in large part to the leadership of Jan Lieber. In 2020, we accelerated $2 billion in capital work and leveraged and took advantage of low ridership periods to work efficiently and deliver improvements for our customers. To name a few examples, we opened a stunning new entrance at Penn Station for Subway and Long Island Railroad customers, which for the first time in decades give Penn a visible identity on 7th Avenue. We completed the rollout of the Omni Fair payment system on subways and buses by the end of 2020 installed new elevators at 11 stations system-wide, finished the L train project on time and on budget, and implemented positive train control on both commuter railroads by the federal deadline. Additionally, we look forward to the council's support and partnership on the soon to be rolled out zoning for transit accessibility proposal. This citywide zoning text amendment would provide an avenue for more private funding of ADA improvements freeing up capital funding that can be allocated to additional accessibility projects. Improving accessibility across the system in every borough is a top priority. Last week, we announced the hiring of Pamela Royo as the MTA's first ever all agency chief accessibility officer. You, I know you are all familiar with Q, 
He served in a similar capacity for the New York City Department of Transportation. He knows the city and is respected for his work on behalf of those with disabilities. We're really excited to welcome you aboard. We want to build on the successes I've outlined, or outlined here as much as possible to bring the system into the 21st century. As you all know, a robust MTA is the great equalizer in New York and the shot in the arm New York City needs to lead its economic recovery, and frankly, that of the nation. We're eager to work with you and our partners at every level of government to make this happen. We're happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker, uh, do you have questions? Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Pat. Uh, for your testimony. Uh, I want to start by talking about overnight service. I touched on this briefly during my opening, but I really just want to <laughs> hammer home the real human impact that this is causing. Uh, you know that this is a 24-7 city. Uh, we slowed down during the pandemic, but we didn't stop. Our hospitals uh, didn't close from 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. Uh, we didn't wait to stop grocery store shelves. First responders are always on call. Essential workers need to be there no matter what. And I think it's clear that the lion's share of this work is being done by communities of color. Not only are they dealing with the threat of COVID every day, uh, but we are in many instances keeping them away from their families longer when the system shuts down. Uh, I think we're making it uh, harder than it needs to be. So I wanna see if you agree with any of that and uh, if you think that overnight service has an outsized impact on communities of color. So speaker, uh, I, I, think our, uh, I, I think we're in much lockstep on this issue and let, let me explain the decision. Throughout the pandemic from the first days, we've been driven by minimizing public health risk to our customers and our employees. That has been, is, and will continue to be job one. The advice that still uh, pertains from the FDA and the CDC, and I'll read a brief quote uh, from the uh, EPA uh, issued, frankly, a couple of days ago this week, is that significant disinfecting of transit properties across the country first is, is recommended by the FDA and the CDC to protect the public health of customers and employees. That continues to be the case. We, we take that direction seriously. The reason for the 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. closure, which we began on May 6th with great reluctance and look forward to the day we return New York City to 24 hour subway service was driven by public health concerns and continues to be driven by public health concerns. Before I note what our customers think, I, I do wanna read the advice that we got from the EPA, literally, Speaker, a couple of days ago. Dr. Sean Ryan, who's director of US EPA's Homeland Security Program, says surfaces are still recognized as a route for exposure to the virus. Therefore, in addition to social distancing and wearing a mask or face covering to reduce exposure to aerialized virus, Current CDC and EPA guidance suggests frequent hand washing, as well as cleaning and disinfecting surfaces that are frequently touched by many people. That guidance is echoed by the CDC and, and the FDA, and frankly, their counterparts across the world. High touch surfaces on subway stations and in subway cars require multiple disinfecting during the day. And the only way we're able to accomplish that is by the 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. closure, because it is far more efficient to do these disinfecting regime when there aren't customers on subway platforms and subway stations. And to be able to continue to tell our customers that we're doing everything we can to minimize health risk to them. I'll also note that in a survey uh, that the MTA did of its cu uh, customers, uh, in English and all the title six languages. Over 75% of our customers strongly agree that the, the stations are dramatically cleaner than they were before May 6th and that they've never seen subway stations and subway cars as clean as they are. 
th thank you, Pat, for, for reading the, the guidance uh, from the EPA and from the CDC. I, I do think that it is pretty clear at this point that the primary focus on transmission is on aerosol transmission, not surface transmission. Though, again, we wanna make sure that we are careful. I just wanna ask you that uh, even if we needed to maintain uh, some enhanced cleaning protocols, we shouldn't you know, need to close the system and leave riders stranded. Other cities like Chicago have managed to clean their transit systems without sacrificing service. So have you, have you talked to other major transit systems across the country like the transit system in Chicago to see how they've managed to, uh, to continue to clean without sacrificing service? Uh, we, we have speaker. Uh, we, we've also talked to uh, T, TFL, uh, which closed its night tube, tube under night, uh, under, uh, underground service. Uh, same thing with respect to MTR and Hong Kong, uh, Toronto Transit uh, Commission as well. Uh, CTA is running a, a, a couple, uh, actually two of its eight lines. The others are closed uh, overnight. Uh, closing is the case at MBTA, uh, WMATA, Washington, SEPTA, Philadelphia, BART, San Francisco, uh, and, and others across the system. Uh, we take the FTC and the CDC's guidance, uh, uh, we, we take it quite seriously. Uh, we're, mul we're doing multiple disinfecting uh, a day of subway stations, subway cars, same with respect to Metro North and Long Island Railroad, and, and, and we're gonna continue that. I, I think that in doing this disinfecting, and you're quite right, Speaker, that aerosols have been identified as the primary source but the guidance from the public health officials in the United States and across the world continues to be that surface or fomite transmission is serious and has to be addressed. Our customers, frankly, demand it. Do you think that uh, if we continue to uh, keep saying that these cleanings are essential, it is eventually going to be harder to convince people it is safe to come back to the trains when you stop these enhanced uh, cleanings? So, Speaker, with all due respect, I, I think it's quite the contrary. I, I, I think the existence of this cleaning and the 76% of our customers that strongly agree that the disinfecting has made the subway cars and the stations cleaner than they've ever been. I, I, I don't know what the disinfecting regime, because no one knows, I don't know what the disinfecting regime is going to be required in 2022 or 23 or 24. Hey, here, here's what I'm certain about, Speaker, that no system in the United States or around the world will be cleaning at the level it was doing in 2019 in, in perfect good faith in accordance with the regulations. So stepped up disinfecting and the latest uh, advances in terms of uh, filters and dealing with aerosols and dealing with surface uh, transmission, uh, our customers and customers across the, the country and the world will, will be seeing that. We're, we're not going back to 2019. Okay. Uh, I want to just, uh, again, continue on this. You know, we are uh, uh, the number one priority for the city and state uh, should be, and I think is getting as many New Yorkers vaccinated as quickly as possible. You talked about how the MTA, of course, is making, uh, trying to ensure that its employees, especially the ones that are on the front line, are getting those inoculations. That's the only way we're going to get out of this crisis. Once we have a decent supply line, uh, we are not going to hit our goals unless we are vaccinating 24 hours a day. And we can set up all the 24 hour sites that we want. But if they only serve people who live close enough to walk or who can afford to take a car, uh, it's going to be hard for, me, for us to make the progress that we need fast enough. And if we don't get New Yorkers vaccinated, you know, it's this vicious cycle of not being able to fully reopen and get our economy back on track. So with that being said, do you have a target date for when you want the MTA to bring overnight service back? Sure, uh, Speaker, let, let me uh, just address the vaccination issue. Obviously federal uh, supply and distribution continues to be an issue. Uh, I'm happy to report that uh, we have arranged vaccinations for over 6,000 uh, of our employees. Uh, our employees are smart and, and uh, savvy. And frankly, if there was additional doses available, that number would be uh, much higher. Uh, at this point, we've also uh, given diagnostic tests to about 32,000 
uh, of our employees. Speaker, with, with respect to when, I, I think the answer to that continues to be when the governor declares the pandemic over and lifts the state of emergency, uh, we will promptly move to return uh, the 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. Uh, service. And, and we, we look forward uh, to, 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 to that date coming as early as possible. And what metrics or milestones will be used to determine that? Is it just the uh, emergency being over or are there other metrics and milestones like uh, infection rate, hospitalization rate, you know, say it comes down when vaccinations uh, go up uh, significantly uh, and we are, you know, below 3% or, you know, whatever the number is, what are the metrics and milestones that will be used besides when the pandemic is over for us to be able to safely reopen? So, so Speaker, uh, I, I know what I know, and I know the many things that I don't know, and I, I, I'm not going to express a, a view on that. I, I'm going to leave that uh, to the federal CDC, to the governor, to Dr. Zucker at the state, the state health department. But we've, we've been clear from the beginning, we, we, we close 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. with great reluctance. We, we are aware acutely of the inconvenience that it uh, causes for many of our customers, essential workers, first responders, women and men uh, of communities in color. But, but, but that decision will be made uh, at, at the state and federal level and, and not by the MTA speaker. I think it would be helpful if there were some public verifiable metrics and milestones for returning to overnight subway service, just for the public to understand how we make these decisions. Well, I, I understand, uh, Speaker, I, I, I suggest that the clarity of the governor declaring the pandemic over and listing, uh, lifting the state of emergency, which will be happy days. Uh, and, and I can look forward, I can envision rather crowds in Times Square and other parts of Atlantic, uh, uh, Barclays Arena and other parts around the city celebrating that. Uh, but I, I think that's going to be the, the, the governor's declaration of lifting the, 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 the state of emergency, I think, will be, will, will be quite clear at that point. And one of my concerns is that the longer that we wait, the less likely it is that we'll ever get this service back. Have there been discussions, any discussions about permanently ending overnight service? No. Uh, in, in, in short, no. So we, we will eventually, at some point, get 24-hour service back. The, the, the answer is absolutely, and, and we're looking forward to doing that as, uh, as soon as possible. Okay, I, I have a lot more questions, but I'm not going to get to them all uh, because there are a lot of council members that have questions, so I want to uh, just try to be quick on this. I have a bunch of questions on homelessness. I'm not going to go into all of them, but I do just want to say, you know, uh, there was the issue last week or over the weekend related to the tweet from New York City Transit and I think Chair Rodriguez uh, mentioned this in his opening statement related to benches being removed to quote, prevent homeless people from sleeping on them. I just wanna see what, what happened there and if that was why benches were being removed. Well, the, the short answer to that question is, is, is no, that's not why the benches were removed. And I'll, I'll ask Sarah Feinberg to, uh, to, to speak to what was done in that uh, station. Thanks, Pat, and, and, and thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, in the, I assume you're referring to the 23rd Street station on the F line. Yes. Uh, we did remove some benches there uh, and have since replaced uh, two of the benches there. Um, we uh, removed the benches and, and cleaned and sanitized them and then put new ones in. Um, and I'm happy to, to go into that more if you need to. Yeah, I just want to make sure that we're not, you know, uh, homelessness is, of course, uh, a very serious problem in the city. I know, Pat, you mentioned in your opening statement about needing greater coordination and support from the city as it relates to mental health providers and social workers to partner with the MTA to get people that the help, get people the help that they need. We know this is a complex issue. We know that we have a record number of homeless people in New York City. And the vast majority of homeless people are not even people that you're seeing uh, on the trains or on the street. It's families or children uh, that are in homeless shelters across New York City. Uh, the people that you're seeing out there that are chronically homeless are some of the folks that are really suffering the most. And I don't want to generalize, but I'll say that, you know, a, a good number of them have untreated mental health issues. 
and they need the help that 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 they need to to get through that. And many of them have substance uh, use issues, and they need help there as well. And we want to make sure that they get that. But I want to make sure that we are not being cruel in any way in creating policies that put people out in the cold uh, during these difficult times with a record number of people in the shelter system that uh, we're not doing things that are kicking people out in these hard days and hard months uh, just for the purpose of not having uh, homeless people on the subways. And so I, I just wanted to see if you could talk a little bit about that because we do not want to be punitive uh, towards homeless individuals who are really, really struggling right now. We want to be compassionate towards them to make sure they get the help that they need. And I think there are, of course, many, many advocates and elected officials who are worried that some of these actions that are being taken are being taken for punitive reasons. And I don't mean punitive to, to, to uh, you know, to, to try to hurt homeless people. I mean, since there aren't these holistic solutions in place, Instead of doing the hard work involved, it's easier just to sort of shut the trains down or, or kick people off and get them on the streets. And we know that the com this compounds the problem for many homeless struggling New Yorkers. So Speaker Johnson, I, you are, I, I cannot tell you, you are preaching to the choir. Before I even became president of New York City Transit, this was something I was relentless about when I was sitting on the board. I have called on the city, I have begged for help from the city to give us more, to send more mental health assistance to many of the folks who are in our system. We have begged the city to use, allow us to use the 311 system so that people in our system can call 311 and report an issue that they're seeing. Someone who needs a mental health intervention, someone who needs a substance abuse intervention, someone who seems to be a danger to themselves or others. I have asked certainly for more people to, you know, more resources to come into our system. Right now, the city doesn't let substance abuse or mental health specialists come into our system and help people. We are ground zero for folks who are having a mental health crisis. And frankly, we're not necessarily ground zero for a homelessness crisis. We don't ask people their, you know, their housing situation when we are dealing with, you know, a, a, an emotionally disturbed person or someone who's in the middle of a crisis. We're just dealing with the moment that we're in and trying to solve for that. And so there is, I can tell you, no policy that is punitive towards those who are experiencing homelessness or frankly, even those who are experiencing a mental health crisis. If there's anything we've done over the last year, it's just beg for more help. And so I see this as a place where we can work closely with you and some of your colleagues. You know, there absolutely needs to be more resources thrown at mental health. We are absolutely happy to partner. We have to be a system that focuses on moving people. Even in the heights of this pandemic, we were moving essential workers day and night. You know, we are moving 3 million people a day now, which is more than any, you know, public transit agency in the country. And um, our focus has to be delivering those folks safely and efficiently to where they're going. That is all we can do at this point. You know, it is already a big task. And so when we, when the, when, when social services fall to us as well, it's just too much for one agency to handle. And you know, so I would love to be able to do it all, but we can't. But we would love to work with you, so and, and your colleagues, so that we can help make a dent here. But you know, we have begged for help, and we we continue to need it. Okay, and then uh, lastly, I just uh, wanna, uh, I'm sure there are a lot of questions on 24 seven service and homelessness that members will get to. Uh, Pat, uh, uh, you mentioned it in your opening. Uh, I was happy to, to try to do my best to connect you with Secretary uh, Buttigieg uh, about uh, the MTA's needs uh, and uh, especially on congestion pricing, which the hope is to eventually be able to get $15 billion uh, in funds related to the MTA capital program, uh, related to the revenue that could come in on congestion pricing. Uh, you know, I sent a letter a couple of weeks ago uh, to Secretary Buttigieg uh, asking that, uh, given that former Secretary Chow and the Trump administration, uh, I think very um, uh, wrongly denied us the ability to move forward on this, do you have any updates on, on where we are? I know you haven't connected with the new secretary yet, 
but given the good conversations that you've been having with the Biden folks leading into him taking office, with the New York congressional delegation, uh, the money that Senator Schumer, Majority Leader Schumer, got the $8 billion in the two different uh, plans last year for the MTA, the hope for an additional $8 billion uh, to get us where we need to be to cover uh, the out years for the MTA. And given how important the congestion pricing revenue is for the capital plan, could you just give us some updates on where you think things stand and, and sort of iteratively uh, what you need to happen over the next few months to feel some greater security about moving forward on that to help the MTA in its planning to come out of this recovery? Uh, first speaker, thank you for the introduction and thanks for the letter of support to uh, the now secretary. I think he was secretary designee when you sent that letter. Uh, that, that support's incredibly helpful. Look, following the cynical years of the Trump administration in which central business district tolling, which is a huge environmental positive, right? Uh, it reduces congestion uh, in the central business district throughout the entire city, improves air quality, uh, and funds mass transit. And it was held up on the purported pretext of uh, they didn't know what environmental uh, road for us to go down. Uh, there, there's much reason to be optimistic, obviously, with the election of a pro-transit uh, president uh, of the United States and with Senator Schumer's ascension to the Senate majority uh, role. I, I, I'd also be uh, deficient if I, didn't men if I didn't mention that the role of uh, Commissioner, a uh, former US D uh, New York City DLT Commissioner Prolly Trottenberg and her new role at the United States Department of Transportation, I, I think is an incredibly important step. I think there's a reason to be optimistic. We had extensive discussions with the, uh, uh, with the transition team and, and are ready uh, at the, uh, you know, at the convenience of, of the secretary and his team uh, to go down in Washington, brief them on the central business district tolling and get it moving as quickly as possible. And you're quite right that central business district tolling uh, accounts for fully 30 percent uh, of the funding in the new capital plan. So it is a critical funding source. And what's the timing on when you'd want some forward progress on it from this new federal administration, the new leadership at USDOT? So, Speaker, the answer to that question is uh, 18 months ago. <laughs> okay, as quickly as possible. Uh, the, the, answer is, the answer is as soon as possible. There's no reason why the Trump administration could not have could not have given us the direction that we uh, that we seek, and uh, we're, we're looking forward to uh, you know expeditious consideration of the issues by the new team. Okay, thank you all. I, I I have more questions, but I can't get to them. Thank you, Chair Rodriguez. Thank you for being here today. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, Chairman, thank you for your role. Thank you for your leadership and Sarah too and the whole team. I know it's a big challenge. It's also it's a great opportunity for the city of New York to have your leadership to run the largest transportation system, again, in the whole nation and one of the largest one in the whole world. So we do appreciate your dedication to serving transportation in previous role and the role that you have right now. Uh, but can you, in my belief, I think that the crisis, the financial crisis of the MTA is even worse than what you have been told. Can you describe what is the current financial crisis that is affecting the agency because it should be a responsibility for all of us to bring the support and as you describe, new change in DC, having Schumer's the majority, having Polly, and again in DC, having the speaker with great relationship with the new uh, chairman of, of, of uh, Secretary of Transportation. There's a lot of factors that we have in place, but in order for all of us, including the New York City Congressional Delegation, to advocate, to hear from everyone who is following the MTA, can you describe with more details the current financial crisis of the MTA? Certainly. So, so Chairman, let, let me let me start, and I'm going to turn it over to, to, to Bob Forney, our CFO. Uh, and, and let me begin by saying this: uh, I, I do want to thank you, uh, your colleagues, and the members of the New York congressional delegation for your steadfast support uh, for the uh, CARES uh, bill in the spring and the. Uh, 
COVID relief that was passed in the lame duck session. Uh, simply before turning over to Bob, our, our revenue sources are primarily twofold. Uh, we get roughly half of our revenue from our customers, which is uh, fares and, uh, and, and tolls. Uh, fair revenue is about $6 billion. Uh, and we get a similar 50% of our revenue from a package of subsidies payable to the MTA put in place by the state legislature over a period of decades. The, the unfortunate reality, and this is a shocking fact, is that the decline in ridership in our fair revenue during the pandemic is orders of magnitude worse than it was during the Great Depression. And, it, it, the, and the pandemic has had a similar significant negative impact on the other half of our revenue, uh, that from a dedicated package of, uh, of subsidies uh, put in place over a period of years uh, and, and decades. Uh, and just to give you one factoid, and I'll turn it over to Bob, at the worst days of the depression, uh, which started with the October 1929 stock market crash to 1933, which was the bottom of subway ridership, subway ridership was down 13, 14%. In the worst days of the pandemic, subway ridership was down 95%. And even today is down 70%. I'm not gonna go through the comparable data for all of the agencies, because it, 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 it varies from agency to agency. But obviously, given our reliance on fair revenue, uh, that has exacted a huge financial toll uh, on the agency. With, with that, I'll ask Bob to uh, provide specifics. Thank you very much. Uh, we commissioned McKinsey to go and to look at a study to see what the impact of the pandemic would be, both on a ridership and therefore fair and toll revenue, and also in terms of the taxes and subsidies that we receive. Uh, the projection over a two-year period was that the losses were probably midpoint about almost $12 billion. So if you realize that our budget is at around $17 billion a year, to lose $12 billion over two years is just horrendous. Um, we have done significant cost cutting to try to solve it on our part. The state legislature has given us the ability to use the lockbox monies, which was to be dedicated for the capital program for last year and for this year to kind of help meet the need. Um, but it's just not enough. The answer to our problem is continued federal support. The federal government is the only party available to provide the significant resources that we need. The state and the city are facing their own situations, as you know, and so the only party that has the ability to provide the resources we need is the state. Uh, we have received $4 billion this past year. We've got the promise of $4 billion that was given in December. We expect to see that money shortly, but we need at least another $8 billion to get us through 2024 even continuing to do cost-cutting measures, tightening the belt, trying to save money wherever we can. But no, this is a dire financial situation on an operating budget. And what it's doing, it's constraining us very tightly on what we can do for the capital program. And we need the capital program to maintain a state of good repair and modernize the system in terms of signals, modernize the system in terms of ADA support, things like that that our customers need and demand. So until we can get right again in terms of our operating budget, and that will require additional support from the federal government, we're not going to be able to support the capital program in a level that we need to. So we're seeing constraints on the operating budget and on the capital budget. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm going to say a few words in Spanish before asking the new question. Uh, uh, quiero decir de que hoy nosotros estamos con el liderazgo del speaker Corey Johnson y todos los colegas en una audiencia con el chairman del MTA, Pat Foy, la presidenta de New City Transit, el encargado de finanzas, donde hoy nosotros queremos asegurar que la MTA sepa que tiene el apoyo de todos nosotros eh, cuando pedimos de que haga más inversión federal para que pueda tener su presupuesto de correr los trenes, los autobuses a tiempo, pero también hoy le estamos pidiendo a la MTA que tomen las medidas necesarias para ahorrar dinero, para asegurarnos también de que los servicios se puedan restaurar lo más pronto posible en la hora de la madrugada, porque el recorte de esos servicios, el cierre de los trenes en la madrugada, afecta principalmente a los inmigrantes, a la gente afroamericana, latina y asiática, pero también entendemos de que es una responsabilidad de todo asegurarnos 
de que buscar los fondos para la NTA no sea buscando en el futuro un aumento en la tarifa. Así es de que esperamos todo apoyar el liderazgo de la NTA, pero también pidiéndole a ellos que se tome la medida necesaria para que no se afecten los servicios. Eh, my next question is on, on how much it will be needed eh, if the services will be restored again from one to five in the morning. How much more will the MTA have to spend to restore those services? Um, I'm, or I, I will respond. Uh, I don't know exactly what the level is, but the service that was discontinued uh, was not done as a cost cutting measure. It wasn't done as a cost saving measure. In fact, we're now running additional bus service and we're still running the trains to keep the workers able to move back and forth. But it wasn't done as a cost saving measure. So but how much, what, 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 what can be the estimate? And I have my question about, you know, advocating on and the need to restore it. And, and I know the important and I've been with the NTA also distributing masks. What is the estimate on how much every day it costs to bring the train back from one to five in the morning? Again, I don't have that number. What is the estimate? As a person who run the finance, what can be, I, I, what was? Mr. Mr. Chairman, I don't have that number. But again, we are continuing to run trains to keep our workers but, moving but back and forth. Get, I understand, but you can send that number to us, right? We can we can see what we can provide for you, yes. As a person who runs the finance, there's not a number that you can send to that someone has in your team on how much it costs the MTA to run it from one to five. I just don't have that number. I don't have the information here. We can provide you with information. I just don't have that information with okay. you. That, that's all I would like to know that yeah. this is information I have and you can send it to us. Uh, Chairman, we, we will do that. Okay, thank you, Chair. And, and, and of course, like, as you know, it's, this is about all of us playing different role. I will be the first one advocating, you know, to get all, all the resources that you guys need in order to run another difficulty that you're going through. Uh, how much, how does this financial crisis is affecting uh, the capital plan, the 2024, and especially in two areas? Our plan that you guys put it together, a great plan to expedite and to upgrade the signal system. As you know, before it used to be like a 40-year plan you had a plan, a more vision one, based on what you had before the COVID-19. So how is this fiscal crisis affecting a scheduling a, to, to a start, to continue capital plan, especially on upgrading the signal system? And now that you have, and I thanks for you to bring a Q Arroyo on board on overseeing everything to make the station accessible, also to make those pieces, upgraded signal system and, and making the station accessible. So uh, Chairman, let, let, let me start. Uh, in the capital plan that was approved by the board and the CPRB in Albany, $51.5 billion, excluding uh, bridges and tunnels. Uh, the, that capital plan is largely on hold uh, and I'll just give you one example of a consequence in that. In 2020, Jano Lieber and his team had planned to award about $13.5 billion. As a result of the pandemic and the fact that the capital plan, the new capital plan was largely put on hold, about $5.4 billion was awarded. And as I mentioned in my opening remarks, we accelerated projects to the tune of about $2 billion. The uh, CARES money was important in dealing with the 2020 deficit. Uh, the uh, deficit financing that we did through the Federal Reserve Bank in 2020, about $3.4 billion, uh, that was attractive money compared to the market, but deficit financing obviously has an impact on our ability to do capital projects. If we are able to get the $8 billion that we've requested 
uh, in the COVID relief and stimulus bill that the Biden administration is working on and Senator Schumer is working on. Uh, that would cover our deficits in 2022, 20, 23, uh, and 24. The, the other unknowns, Chair, in terms of being able to revive the capital plan is, uh, as we, we discussed just a couple of minutes ago, 30% of the capital plan comes from central business district tolling. We're optimistic as a result of the new administration being in place and Senator Schumer being in his role. There are other pieces of that, including $7 billion of federal funding that we've assumed, and I think there's reason to be optimistic on that. The three billion from the state is in the is in the governor's budget. We we hope and expect that the three billion from the city will be in the uh, in the city budget. If all these things are in place, we should be able to unpause the capital plan to a substantial degree, or if everything falls into place, to do the whole fifty one and a half billion dollars, which is our goal. Okay. And Chairman, I, I assume, and, and I take your word when you say that it was a mistake when one of the workers of the MTA said that the removal of the benches was to avoid homeless to use them. So it, it, again, I, we all made mistake and I take it as a mistake. And can we expect for all New Yorkers to know that no benches will be uh, removed and all of them who were remove uh, that station will be back and uh, none of them will be removing other stations. Sarah, Sarah, can you speak to the specifics on that station? Yes, sorry, I muted and unmuted and remuted myself. Um, so to, to be clear, I think someone said that the tweet was a mistake because it was didn't have sufficient context and was tweeted in error. Um, the two of the benches have been uh, replaced. Uh, but to your point about, you know, assuming that we won't make any kind of changes to stations going forward, I, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to agree to that. Obviously, we have a massive system to, to maintain and to manage with 472 stations. And so, you know, happy to work with you and your team and others on the city council to let you know how we're, how we're handling various issues in stations. But, um, but I can't promise we won't make changes to stations going forward. Have any other benches been removing other stations? We have on occasion uh, removed benches from stations, I think going back several years at this point for various reasons, um, you know, because we're changing the layout of a station because it makes sense to remove them and occasionally as a last resort um, due to some encampment issues and then often um, replace them. But uh, this is a, something that we've done on occasion for years. In the, in the last, as, as looking at this particular period of time when the bench was removed on 23rd Street, where any station got benches removed at the same time that they were removed at 23rd Street? I'm not sure I totally follow the question, but I, if you're asking me if we moved addition, removed additional benches that day, that we did not. If there were, yeah, if there were other stations that no. got their bench removed during the same time no. when those benches were removed that station? No. Okay, thank you. And, I just and want to reiterate that I would reiterate my call to um, partner with the city council on trying to get some additional resources for mental health distress and for um, for issues that are happening in the city. Again, you know, we are a transportation agency, and if we could get some assistance on, you know, being able to use the three one one system, being able to get mental health, you know, intervention into the system, being able to get substance abuse intervention into the system, we would be incredibly grateful for any help. And, and, and of course, and the answer is yes, we need to establish a partnership. And that's what I said this morning and when I was at a conference, press conference in the Radis Alliance that, you know, it is time. I respect the leadership of all the governors and the mayor. I know that it is more easy to criticize what they're doing it than to understand that they work 24 seven. And even though we don't agree on everything, but they've been playing an important role in this difficult time. Uh, 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 however, I believe that the crisis inside the train station is a responsibility of both the city and the state. Uh, there's so many, you know, I appreciate I mean, the numbers of homeless uh, that they get in the support, but I feel that still as many, some of those homeless are in the street 
we are not connecting them with the necessary resources that they deserve. And I think it should require both for the New York State Department of Health and the New York City Department of Health to work in collaboration so that we can connect them with other services. It, but as far as with you, Sarah, you say that it, as, as you were answering the speaker, you say that uh, you wanted to get more support because you mentioned something that the city was not responding or there was something on the 311 uh, uh, call that uh, when they were made, the city were not allowed. Can you explain what is that situation? Yeah, ha I'm happy to expand on that. So right now, if you're um, anywhere in the city and you dial 311 to um, to report, um, you know, someone who may need a mental health uh, assistance or mental health intervention or substance abuse intervention, 311 answers the phone and asks you where you are and you give them an address and then they send help to you right away or send help to the person that you've called for right away. If that call happens in the subway system, you know, you call from the subway system and say, I'm at, you know, the Bleecker Street Station and, and someone here seems like they could use some real assistance at this moment. 311 asks you for an address and you say, I'm at the Bleecker Station and they say, no, I need a street address. And of course, I'm sure there are people out there who know the street addresses of all of the subway stations. I'm not one of them and I don't think most people know that. And so the 311 operator says, I can't help you. You're just gonna have to call the police. And of course, you know, the calling the police is, is, a, is, a, is a good option in certain circumstances if someone's about to harm themselves or others, but it's certainly not a good um, option most of the time. And particularly when what we're talking about is someone who's in a mental health crisis who desperately needs intervention and assistance. So for the last few years, literally for two or three years, we've been asking the city to enter into the 311 system subway stations. It seems like, I am not a tech expert, it seems like an easy fix to me. Um, we've recently you know, gotten some movement from the city that they say they're taking a close look at it and that they hope that they can make some real movement on that in the coming days or weeks or months. But that is absolutely something that uh, we desperately need. It means someone in the system can call and register that complaint and help will actually come. So we don't reach a point where someone who could have, you know, who needed an intervention on the previous 10 or 12 or 15, you know, moments didn't get one. And then we have some sort of incident that happens in the system that, you know, where someone gets hurt. Um, so, you know, again, I, I think we can get from the city council would be um, absolutely appreciated. I believe that this is something that could go a long way towards helping. I, I believe that this is something definitely that the city should know, uh, that the city should correct. Uh, I feel that, I, I, again, I've been fair with both the mayor and the governor, and I would like to see working closer, but I feel that uh, the scenario that you described is unacceptable, and I hope, again, not only I know that you get the support from the speaker, myself, and my colleague at the council, but now I'm calling on City Hall to correct, you know, the way how you're describing and on the 311 not responding immediately when the call is made from the station. This is about human rights. This is about connecting people with the whole support that they need. And I'm more than happy to follow with you after uh, this hearing and the speaker to see how we get conversation with, with City Hall to see how we can correct it. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. And my last question uh, 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 is about the cost, uh, how much it costs for to the MTA to disinfest the station. And uh, Bob, in, in March, 20, March 24, 2020, uh, you as a chairman reporter in the New York Times op-ed that the MTA estimate it would need 300 million for its disin disinfection effort. However, the estimate was made when the subway were being disinfected every 72 hours. As May 6, 2020, so we begin a disinfected daily. How much did the MTA spend on disinfecting, disinfecting 2020? And how much is the budget for cleaning effort in 2021? We spent so last, uh, oh, get Bob, sir. Uh, last Please, year Bob. we spent 200 and about 250, 260 million dollars on the cleaning. Again, it wasn't a full year. We expect it could be 350 thereabouts going forward. Okay, thank you guys. Now I'm turning it back to my colleague who also may have questions. 
Thank you, Chair. Uh, we will now call on council members in the order that they have used the Zoom raise hand function. Council members, please keep your questions to five minutes. The Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and they will let you know when your time is up. Um, council member Lander will be first, followed by council member Koo. Council member Lander. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I'll take off. You can see I'm wearing my MTA subway outreach mask, and I want to begin by appreciating all the subway worker outreach that I've seen, kind of acknowledge the remarks of the speaker and the chair about the suffering and sacrifice those workers have made, um, and appreciate the tireless work that they and you are doing to save our subways, get federal aid, and implement congestion pricing. Um, I also appreciate your mention of the transit zoning bonus, which I know not too many people will focus on, but we're eager to make that work in the Gowanus neighborhood rezoning to provide funding for a new elevator, stairwell, and entrance at the Union Street NR station. Um, there are some questions about how to make that work, um, and I think that's going to require additional input from the MTA, so I, I'm sure this is true, but I just want to make sure you'll sit down with us soon with City Planning and City Hall and my office so we can figure out how to make that work to provide investment for the subway that it so, so much needs. Uh, council member, a couple of things. One is thank you for wearing that handsome mask. Uh, second, thank you for joining the uh, mask force. Uh, th there you go, thank you. Uh, and uh, lastly, yes, uh, we, we'd be happy to sit down with, uh, uh, with you and the city on uh, the uh, transit accessibility uh, zoning and uh, uh, with particular application to Guanas and other applications around the city. I, I think it's an important, uh, important change that will benefit the city. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, there is a lot we agree on and a lot we want to do to save the subways, but I am going to spend the re remainder of my time on 24-7 service and this issue of overnight deep cleaning because I have to say I'm, I'm deeply distressed by the answers that you've given today. I'll be honest, I find them highly cynical. I think it's hygiene theater. It is true that a majority of riders say they like it, that it looks clean. I'm sure if you just honestly ask them, do you like the subways better without homeless folks in them? They would probably say yes, but that would not mean homeless people had better services or that homelessness was reduced or that homeless people weren't up on the streets freezing. And it wouldn't mean service was being provided and it wouldn't mean essential overnight workers had access to 24 seven service they need. And it wouldn't mean people without cars um, had the ability to get to 24 seven vaccination sites. And it wouldn't even mean that, that you were improving public health outcomes. Of course, you know, if you're going to say we have to do everything we can with no responsibility for any of the other things I mentioned, then you can justify it in the ways that you have. But the overwhelming preponderance of public health experts who have looked at this question do not believe that it makes sense to continue closing the subways overnight and spending the amount we're spending on making the subways shiny, but not actually making them safer in measurable ways and that they don't provide all those other things that are needed. So I just wanna ask a couple of questions here that, that I wanna make sure I understand. So the governor's established a four tier system for opening and closing tied to a wide range of data points. He's allowing 25% indoor dining to resume in New York City this Friday, despite the fact that the positivity rate remains above the level he set. But if I understood what your answer was to the speaker, you're not tracking any data. You have no plan for reopening uh, governed by positivity rates. You are just going to wait until the governor says the emergency is over and you don't plan to reopen the subways overnight despite the issues of vaccine distribution um, at all. There, there's not any data that you're tracking that you're looking at reopening. You're simply going to wait for the governor's order. Well, look, we're tracking the data, of course, for the city and the region and, and, and for the MTA. We, in a way, we're not in a way the subway reopening the overnight when some of that data indicates it can be safely done or not. Yes or no? So respectfully, let, let me finish. You're uh, focusing on the customer survey. It, the customer survey is one of four or five reasons why this decision is, is the real one. We're, we're in a service delivery bit business and, and what our customers think about actions that we take is A, extraordinarily important to us, but B, given that ridership is so low and we're all in the business of bringing people back to offices and to restaurants and to Broadway and to Yankee Stadium, what customers think is fundamentally important. However, this decision is driven by FTA guidance and CDC guidance. And the quote that I read from the uh, director of EPA's Homeland Security Program, 
who, who all of whom say- I'm gonna take back my time because I only have 20 more seconds. I, I don't think yeah. it is. I don't think it's the real answer. I believe that you're engaged in hygiene theater. I think it's a cynical approach. The science would support reopening the subways overnight in a way that was safe. And if you helped communicate to riders so they understood it was safe, it would work. Let's get serious about ending homelessness. Let's get serious about keeping our subways safe and clean. Keep those mask distributors out there, but please reopen the subway, establish some data that will make clear how you're going to do it in ways that give riders confidence. Let's restore 24 seven overnight service. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Lander. Um, our next panelist will be Councilmember Koo, uh, who will be followed by Councilmember Reyna. So, Councilmember Koo. Time begins. Thank now. you, thank you. Thank you, Chair Rodriguez and Speaker. And also want to thank uh, Chairman Foy and um, the Transit President, uh, Ms. Feinberg and Mr. Foran. Um, Mr. Chair, you, you mentioned that the bottom line is you have to make sure the customers feel safe in the subway or on the buses. So can you tell us like last year or last two years, uh, what is the crime rate in the subway station or on the, on the buses? How many people get attacked or how many people get pushed down to the subway, the, the tracks? Can you give me like, uh, some statistics? Uh, so, 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 Council Member, recently, as we've all read, there's been a state a spate of attacks on customers and employees, employee assaults, employee uh, spitting, uh, etc. Uh, we we can provide the data which comes from the uh, the NYPD. It's posted on our it's posted on our website. We've invited Chief uh, O'Reilly to uh, report to the uh, uh, to the trans to the, to the to the board uh, of the MTA uh, on these issues, uh, and and we're calling out for additional police resources. Uh, we are impressed by the initiatives that the new chief has uh, has put in place, and we're also, as uh, Sarah Feinberg and I have been talking about, we we need additional mental health resources from the city of New York to deal with people who are suffering uh, from mental illness and, and other issues and are in the subway system. We owe our customers and employees a safe and secure in, environment at all times. Thank you. You know, uh, during my tenure as in the city council, I, I think about 10 years ago or nine years ago, I proposed in the public hearing uh, for transportation that MTA start using platform doors to make sure that passengers don't get pushed down to the tracks or some passengers commit suicide. They jump down to the tracks. That was like 10 years ago. And then a few years ago, there was a, a pilot you were uh, proposed. Uh, can you give us a status on the pilot study or have you done anything on that? Uh, Sarah, do you want to speak to that? I'm happy to. Uh, we did undertake that study, um, and um, I, I we're happy to share. Uh, I obviously don't have it in front of me. I'm happy to share it with you if that's helpful. Um, I think ultimately the determination was that while those doors are, or while those um, barriers are possible, uh, they are unbelievably expensive. Uh, they're not possible in all stations. They would be possible in some stations, uh, but um, would be an extremely expensive uh, solution to um, something that is typically viewed as, as a, um, a you know, problem that happens on occasion and not very often, but that would be a very you know, expensive solution for, some, for dealing with that issue. But look, I thought it was important that we looked at it and appreciate uh, you, you suggesting it and asking for that. And we're happy to, to share uh, details with you. Because you know, in, in cities around the world, Platform doors have been using, they have used platform doors for many, many years, 20, 30, 40 years. And in New York City, we should have the resources to do it, no? Some it's not in all stations, but in some stations at least, no? Some and then if it's not fancy ones, you can create 
at least some simple mechanical ones, like the one they use in Disneyland, right? Just a little a barrier so that when people push you, you can hang on to the barrier that you won't, you won't get pushed onto the subway that easy. You know what I mean? When you go to Disneyland, there, there's a barrier, you know, a pose, uh, three feet, four feet high. Those, those are easy to install and you can open them mechanically, you no. Know? I'm not, I have to say, I'm not familiar with the ones at Disney World, but would be interested to, to follow up on that. Um, I, again, sir, I, I hear you. We've looked at it. it. I will just tell you it's a multi billion dollar, I think it was a $2 billion uh, solution to put these in just a portion of our stations. I know other, I know other systems um, have used them and other systems have contemplated them. But just, I mean, I can go into the details with you offline, but given the nature of our system, the way our platforms are built, the way our trains come in and the and uh, how long our trains are, it's it's slightly complicated, but I'm happy to walk you through it. But, but like I said, right, if there's a will, there's a way. No, if there's no will, there's if no the way. city council no, is willing and to then, pay and then I will absolutely MTA, take your $2 billion. <laughs> MTA, you have spent billions of dollars in building the Oculus, you know, a one World Trade Center. To me, that is a waste of money. I mean, it looks like we're not, MTA is not in the in the, policy, in the business of building museums, you know, or, or, or architectural uh, spenders, you know. We should and build functional so stations. <laughs> uh, you wasted billions of dollars on many, many fancy stations. So council member, so can, you, I, can I make yeah. two? Yeah. Sorry, can I make yeah, two sure. points? One is, yeah, sure, uh, yeah. for better or worse, the uh, Oculus was built by the Port Authority. No MTA funds were involved in that. The, the, the other point I would, I would raise, the systems that have platform doors, including Disneyland, tend to be new systems, new stations that were built assuming uh, platform doors. The, the subways were built by different investor groups 180 uh, years ago. And, and we don't have the uniformity of uh, platform size, platform uh, curves, uh, et cetera. And, and it's one reason why Sarah's estimate for part of the system is right. It would be an extraordinary amount of money, but we'd be happy to have a conversation with you and, and share the results of the pilot. But you have the avenue, <laughs> second avenue extension that you was brand new. Well, how come you didn't consider putting platform there over there? It's brand new there, second avenue. Thank you, council member. Yeah. Thank you, council member Koo. Um, our next council member we will hear from is council member Reynoso. Council member Reynoso. Time begins now. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Speaker, uh, for this hearing. Um, I, I just have a couple of, a couple of uh, questions and, and some concerns. Um, the fact that, you know, the CFO of the MTA wouldn't know uh, what the costs would be to allow for overnight service to resume in the MTA is, is unbelievable. It's unbelievable. And if that is true that the CFO cannot give us information as to the cost of, of what the cost would be to restore overnight service. It kind of speaks to, to like the systemic um, and institutional problems that we have at the MTA. Uh, we should be able to know what it costs us right now to run the MTA as is and a projection as to what it would cost um, should we restore overnight service. And what I'm hearing from the chairman and the CFO is that you ha they have no clue what it would cost to reopen overnight service. And let me, um, I ask- uh, so, so can, Let, 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 me, resp yeah, let when, me respond when, to that. Yeah. What I said was that we, were, we are continuing to run the trains and we are running additional bus service, okay? So there is no savings, you know, or there's no additional cost to put the service back. This is not being done to save money. This is being done to make the cleaning more efficient. So again, that was a statement I said, that we are not doing this to save money and it is not saving us money to, to do the service that we're doing. I said, we will provide additional information to answer the chair's questions, but this is not a cost saving measure. So, so our intern, it would it would not increase the cost of the MTA to open to, to have overnight service restored. In fact, it would probably save us money because okay. we wouldn't have to run 
the additional enhanced bus service. That okay, this is so, not so being why? done. This is being done, as the chairman said, to make the cleaning more efficient and to allow us to do it. Okay, so Bob, I just want to be clear when the chair was asking the question of what it would cost to restore the service from one to five, you kept telling him that you didn't have information or you couldn't present them information. So I'm just trying to clarify here that under the people that are on this call might be under the impression that you didn't answer that question. And what you're saying, it could possibly save us money to have uh, the system restored from one to five. So thank you for that so, clarification. So, so council, ahead, council member, we, we, we'll have the CFO's office look at it and, and we'll come back as, as we promised the speaker and the chair and, and, and you will share it with uh, uh, anybody on the council who wants to see it. Thank you. Uh, and then uh, the second question I have is related to the removing of benches, even though it might seem like a, a, an insignificant issue for you um, and, and the way uh, that uh, Ms. Feinberg kind of put up answered that was we took them out and we put them back in they needed to be cleaned they needed to be changed the type of seating that it, it did we replace the benches with the same type of benches um at 23rd street are they the same benches um that were cleaned out and just restored yes i'm sorry are can you, you hear me are you, yeah i can hear you are you sure about that Yes. Because from what I from what I'm hearing and what I'm seeing is that the benches were actually the the leaning benches where you kind of have to lean against the uh, against the wall, yeah. not the traditional benches where you sit down. So they were not replaced. Uh -oh. So yeah. I, I want to ask you the question to, again. Yes, I, sir, I know what you're saying. You're seeing something on Twitter, and excuse me for stating the no, obvious, no, but Twitter yeah. is not not always where there's a a healthy debate taking place that's full of context it's and all. fine sarah that's why i'm asking you the question so you can clarify so can you clarify that the benches were replaced with the same exact benches on 23rd street yes thank you for clarifying that for everybody watching on twitter the mca has cleared that up and said that the benches on 23rd street are the exact same benches that were there before right thank you yes. um and i just want to say I'm, I'm actually grateful that we have folks here from the MCA. I haven't seen you in a long time um, and I'm glad to see you here. I think it's very important that the relationship we have with the city council be a strong one because we actually are here in an effort to ask for more funding from the federal and state government so that you can actually do the work that needs to be done. We know you're operating in a deficit and there's not, there should be no council member here that is not fighting at, uh, at uh, you know, tooth and nail to make sure that there is a reasonable amount of funding coming to the, to the to the MTA. Um, I'm, I also know that there are council members that fight at a city level with the mayor to, uh, to um, put more funding into the MTA as well, that the city does its part in its contribution. So, you know, showing up to these hearings, hearing us out, letting us hear from you really is meaningful to our relationship in an effort, um, again, to increase funding or, or ensure that funding is coming to the MTA, or at least you have advocates that are doing that. So thank you so much for your time. Council member, we appreciate and thank you for that support. Absolutely. Take care. Thank you, Council Member Reynoso. Um, at this time, are there any other council members that have questions for these panelists? Okay. Uh, next, we will hear from Council Member Miller. Council Member Miller. Time begins now. Uh, Thank you. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Madam President. Um, I, a, a number of questions. So I, I, I guess I'm going to start with my with my. Uh, th let's just talk about the the community and these transportation budgets and some of the uh, the overnight service that had been cut and uh, whether or not it is sufficient to provide. Um, the overnight service to those, to those essential workers. While you have acknowledged that there is uh, a concern that there is an impact on the essential workforce that requires the overnight service, have you considered even your own workforce and the impact on your own workforce traveling somewhere from like Southeast Queens uh, throughout the system and, 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 um, uh, again, and, and I don't want to belabor it, I know that you said that um, as soon as uh, you get the okay from the uh, governing bodies, then we're, we're going to be back online. 
but uh, there are some unintended consequences to the workforce and to essential workers, additional costs to travel, additional time to travel. Um, and, and so what have we done to, to mitigate that and to assist those? Uh, because when you put out the buses there, and particularly in Southeast Queens, there is nothing uh, south of Union Turnpike with, with, with the uh, overnight bus service. Uh, so, you know, how are we communicating uh, in, in terms of putting that out. So I, I just want to get all the questions out. So that would be one part. And then how efficiently are we using the entire system? Are we um, uh, using uh, and, and being able to access uh, the uh, Metro North, Long Island Railroad, the commuter rails in a way that really um, supports uh, New York City Transit, obviously, uh, they, they are at an all time low on the, on the commuter rails in terms of their ridership, it, you know, uh, uh, I, I would submit that it would support not just their ridership, but certainly it, it would help uh, communities that are traditional transportation deserts and having access to uh, um, commuter rails, which oftentimes are uh, cost prohibitive. Uh, we, we've been big advocates of expansion of Atlantic ticket. Um, how, how do we see that playing into the, the, the whole uh, COVID uh, scenario in terms of uh, access and ridership, um, being more efficient with the delivery of services and ensuring that those who are being uh, just negatively impacted by the overnight shutdown having uh, access to the system in its entirety. And then you answer that, and then I'll, I'll put on my labor hat, you know, after we hear from uh, you. Th thanks, Councilman. So uh, first, we, we are aware, obviously, that our employees are, A, essential employees, and some of them affected by the, uh, the 1 a.m. Uh, to 5 a.m. closure. I, I, obviously, many of them are working during that period, uh, you know, doing disinfecting, station work, uh, you know, track work, uh, et cetera. Uh, in, in many cases, their shift will extend beyond the 5 a.m. period and they'll be able to take subway or bus or however it is they uh, the commuted back. The uh, Atlantic uh, ticket uh, pilot uh, continues uh, and is, uh, it is usable. Uh, customers can use Metro North and, uh, and Long Island Railroad. Obviously, there's limited service, as you know, uh, during that uh, during that period of time, but to the extent there is service that uh, on, on a particular line or, or branch, it's available to all all, all customers, including uh, MTA uh, MTA employees. As as we've gone through this uh, exercise, Council Member, uh, we've been uh, acutely aware that uh, our customers are affected by this, which is why we added, as you know, significant bus routes in the 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. period. That, that, that continues. Uh, with respect to, for instance, uh, vaccinations, uh, the uh, city field site uh, will be uh, up and running. Uh, depending on the number of uh, doses, it will be 24-7, but we're already stopping the flushing. Sorry, we're already stopping the Port Washington branch at Willis Point uh, to allow customers uh, from north, south, east, and west to get to City Field if they've got vaccination appointments at any any time of the day to make that uh, to make that commute, uh, you know, even easier. Chair, Chair Foy, so uh, if I may, I'm, I'm going to put on my labor hat, and and obviously I was one of those employees for more than 26 years that 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 traveled back and forth and and reported to work at at 4:15 in the morning and and. And in this day and age, it would be very difficult to do so. Um, at, but in the Committee on Civil Service and Labor, we, we had a hearing uh, about two weeks ago that discussed the um, state of COVID on the, on the municipal workforce. And, and obviously, we had testimony from the TWU, ATU, and, and some of the other bargaining units uh, uh, within the MTA. And, and they had a, a number of, of concerns um, and I want to just talk about some of the things, have you talk about some of the things that really um, have, have supported workplace safety. And, and, I, and, and, and I want to preface it by, by saying, that, excuse me, Mr. Chair, for, for the extra time, that I want to commend the MTA for absolutely being out front and, and, and supporting workers, but more importantly, uh, what the work, the, the, the mem memorializing those employees that was lost, the many uh, um, employees that was lost, supporting the dependent, surviving dependents, 
uh, with, with the benefits and, and, and pensions is, is, is really the template for how we should be treating workers. That being said, as we move forward, what, you know, I'm, 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 I'm receiving calls as many of my colleagues um, about uh, buses being overcrowded. And, and, and I know early on that we addressed that. We, we moved um, uh, back the uh, occupancy on, on the bus. But at, at, at this present time, you know, all the buses are, are often overcrowded uh, to the point that it is uh, impossible to social distance. Um, uh, um, employees obviously are being impacted. There was, there was a testimony of, of a bus operator in Staten Island that two weeks ago uh, uh, at the hearing had, had done everything that he could do to keep himself, protect himself uh, from COVID-19 and had contracted COVID and unfortunately taken it home to his family and, and, and on the day of the hearing, um, the 10 year old son who had also contracted COVID uh, passed away. And these are the unintended most extreme consequences of workers that frontline workers that go out each and every day and, and put themselves on the line to make our lives seamless but go back to their families and communities. What are we doing to protect that? Are we implementing? Um, I'm looking at some of the plans. Um, Omnibus is just coming online, but backdoor service will, um, is that going to resume? Are we going to be able to receive customers through the, through the rear door? And, and um, if not, when? What are we doing to protect workers? And then finally, uh, transportation being a great equalizer. I'm glad that you adopted that. It's something I've been saying forever. Um, and we're talking about, and we've, we've talked about pay equity in industries here at the council all the time. Uh, um, could you tell me about the upcoming contract negotiations and what you're doing to ensure that those on the line are not being paid less than their counterparts uh, in another bargaining unit. And, and I know that's, that's messy, um, but that's what we do here at the council, that um, if there are people doing similar jobs, doing the same job, they should be receiving the same pay, particularly during the time of the pandemic, no one should be going out, putting their life on the line and being paid less than anyone else that's doing the same job. I know it's a Thank lot, you. but- uh, Thank you. I, I, you guys. Thank you, Thank you uh, Chairman, did, can I respond to the council member? Of course. Okay, fine. Uh, good. So, uh, uh, council member, uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, questions uh, in that. Let, let, me, let me talk about uh, what have we done to protect our employees uh, first. Uh, we have, from the first days of the pandemic, I, I think, been a national leader and have been uh, aggressive and innovative and effective uh, in protecting employees and customers. Uh, we've distributed 14 million masks to our, uh, to our employees, uh, 7 million uh, uh, masks to uh, employees, uh, 17 million pairs of uh, uh, gloves to uh, employees, and we have sufficient stockpiles for as long as the pandemic continues, and hopefully that'll be a short period of time, to continue to provide masks, uh, face shields where it's appropriate because of a uh, MTA worker's uh, particular uh, work uh, function uh, and sufficient supplies of mass disinfectant gloves and other PPP uh, as long as this horrible uh, pandemic uh, continues. Uh, we have vaccinated uh, over 6,000 uh, of our employees uh, in the last uh call it two and a half to, to three weeks. Uh, if transit workers are classified or categorized in uh, category 1B, so right after uh, healthcare workers and uh, other uh, first responders. Uh, and uh, we have an additional 12,000 uh, employees who have already signed up in the portal and, and want vaccinations. And the only issue there is supply and distribution from the federal government. Uh, we intend to stand up our own vaccination centers uh, at MTA uh, facilities when we've got 
and, and the, the plans for that are, uh, are complete. Uh, and the, the only thing that is holding back the opening of that is uh, guarantees of sufficient supplies to be able to uh, vaccinate employees at bus depots, subway yards, uh, Metro North and Long Island Railroad uh, facilities. Uh, I, I think we've been effective in communicating to the public and uh, our employees the importance of using PPE, wearing masks, et cetera. We're going to continue. Uh, we're going to continue to do that. Uh, I, I also uh, I ought to mention we have provided diagnostic testing to over 32,000 of our employees. Uh, we're testing at a rate of uh, one to 2,000 a week uh, at, at this point. The diagnostic testing is really critical because it's allowed us to identify approximately a thousand asymptomatic uh, employees who they and their family and their colleagues would not have known that they were uh, infected by COVID-19 might have continued to work and increased the infection rate. We were able to identify those uh, thousand uh, asymmetric, uh, asymptomatic uh, employees. Uh, others uh, who were tested uh, in some cases were returned to the workforce if that was uh, that was appropriate. Uh, and uh, we have throughout been following guidance from the CDC, uh, the Federal uh, Transit Administration, to the extent uh, it related to uh, uh, transit, obviously, the State uh, Department of uh, the State Department of Health. The regimes that we've uh, put in place uh apply to subways, buses, power transit, Staten Island Railroad, bridges, tunnels, Metro North, Long Island Railroad. We've treated every agency uh, with, with the same degree of uh, urgency uh, and, uh, and commitment. Uh, with respect to uh, labor contracts, uh, council member, and uh, I, I think you'll uh, appreciate this answer. I, I'm not going to talk about the status of uh, contracts or negotiations or discussions uh, in, in public it'd be inappropriate for me to do that. Uh, I understand the importance of the issue uh, to you as a member of the city council and as a former union member of uh, uh, the MTA, uh, but I, uh, I, I can't speak uh, in any detail beyond that. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And I just have a few more questions before we get into giving the opportunity for members of the public. And after I ask those questions and you leave Chair, it will be important that you also leave some members of your team to hear the testimony. One of the first ones that will be speaking is going to be members of a great national project that they aiming to create the National Infrastructure Bank. Uh, they've been having conversation with, with members of the Biden Harris team for that idea. There's some members of national institutions that they also are supporting that initiative. And I feel that at a time where everyone knows that the only way of how we can bring back our economy is by investing in our infrastructure. It will be important also that, you know, we hear those innovating ideas. So uh, again, I hope that, and I know that you usually do, some members, of, some members of your team will continue listening when we get to the public so that you can get those testimony. But before- oh, no, uh, Chairman, cha 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 just briefly, as with respect to every city council member, when uh, the three of us leave, we'll have colleagues watching the entire, uh, the entire hearing and all of the, uh, all, all those who testify. Yeah, thank you. Which is that what usually happens. So I know that you, you have a great team in the governmental relation. And, and, and I just want to be sure that I wanted to highlight that one of those who will be testifying is gonna be that it, that the leaders of that big idea to create a national infrastructure bank. My few, few question is to close from my end is about, and in some occasion, uh, uh, I have been joining your team with the distribution of masks to the riders uh, we have done in the last couple of weeks. We were at the 149 uh, for training, for to training grand concourse. Yesterday, I joined also the Brooklyn Board President, Eric Allen, in front of the four and D train in Jerome Avenue. And, and, and again, someone also in the case of the Brooklyn Board President, Eric Adams, who also I had joined effort of calling for the MTA to make, put a plan together to reopen uh, our services 24 seven. But I also understand that, you know, a lot had to do with decision at the state level. 
And I feel that, you know, yes, we want to be different from, and that's how you've been operating from day one, living, leading, letting yourself, leaving the science to make decision on how, you know, we operate and, and how we can control the coronavirus in the stations. So I also see that part of the argument, but in the same time, we also need to be sure that the federal resources are here, they stay on the standard and working with the governor and the mayor that we can be able to provide all the support that you need to reopen the train stations as soon as possible. A question, again, going back to that piece, because in the first part, we all agree. We are partnered to get advocate funding at the national level. Uh, but the piece where we, you know, where we have to be going into the back and forth, we, you don't have to see everything, you know, uh, agree on everything. You have your way of how you explain it. I understand your arguments, but from our end, it's about keep pushing you guys to reopen our train uh, midnight as soon as possible. It's coming from the arguments, as I said at the beginning, you know, most people who use those train are people like myself when I came in the 80s to wash dishes and, and leaving my job at five in the morning. So there's a lot of, of those immigrants, working class, that they work in daily, they work in supermarket, they work in pharmacy, and they the one who maintain our city during the time when a lot of people, you know, need it the most. So why is it that can have you explore and talk to your team about? Of course, I would like to for the train to be reopened as soon as possible, as yesterday. But we know that you know it would. I hear your explanation, but can you explain why? We, it's closing for five hours, like from one to five. Have you explored to scale, scale the plan in a way that you could say, let's close, let's say from three to five, yes, to have two hours to clean the station and, and how the closure is making the cleaning more efficient? Yeah, so Chairman, let me, let me address those uh, questions and uh, thank you for both of them. The, the four hour uh, closure from one to 5 a.m., we, we, we looked at many uh, other options. Uh, shorter period of time, longer period of time, different period of time. F four hours, we believe, is the minimum period that gives us the maximum efficiency. And, and, and the reason why it's more efficient, I, I, I think any subway rider will, uh, will understand. Uh, a, a crowded or half crowded subway car or a crowded or half crowded subway platform can't be disinfected in the period of time that it can be if, if, if the customers are uh, not there. Uh, it, it's just a reality. It, it's also, frankly, safer for customers and for the employees doing the work. Uh, but I and Sarah and, and others have been, uh, for instance, at end of uh, terminal uh, end of ride uh, stations and, and, and watch the cleaning and, and the cleaning is the disinfecting is orders of magnitude more efficient when there aren't customers on the car or on the platform. And, and that calculus led us to the 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. four hour, uh, four hour closure. And we, we did look at other options, which didn't give us that level of uh, uh, productivity and efficiency to be able to clean uh, clean the cars multiple times, disinfect the cars multiple times a day. Chairman, can you explain what happened uh, uh, during those four hours uh, of cleaning the, 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 those train and the stations? Uh, you know, what is going on during those four hours uh, uh, when it comes to procedure uh, on cleaning those stations and the train that could not happen during the daytime? Yeah, uh, Chairman, what, what, what happens is the, uh, the MTA uh, forces go through the cars with unbelievable speed and, and, and efficiency. Uh, and, and they're cleaning all the, uh, the, the, sub, uh, the surfaces on seats, on, uh, on poles, uh, vertical poles, horizontal poles, uh, doors, all, all high touch uh, areas are, are being disinfected. The floors are also uh, being cleaned, and you can imagine how difficult that, that, frankly, impossible it would be to do that work if, if you had 20 or 50 or 100 people on a, on a, on a subway car or hundreds of people on a, on a subway platform. It's just not going to get done. Okay. 
Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the safety of our stations. Uh, yes. Can, can you, uh, as you know, I know it's a big concern for, uh, for all of us. We want to be sure, and I know that you're doing everything you can, everything you're in your ability to address safety, a uh, number of assaults, especially men and women uh, in sunny stations. Uh, uh, can you explain to us how many stations in our train system have camera and what percentage of that cameras are working? So, uh, Chairman, I, I don't have that uh, at my fingertips. Far more than a majority of the stations have, uh, have, have cameras. Uh, the cameras are routinely checked. Some of them, for instance, uh, transmit to the uh, transit, uh, the NYPD Transit Bureau uh, uh, response office in, uh, in, in Brooklyn uh, and is reviewed on a, uh, you know, on, on a real-time basis by uh, the NYPD uh, Transit Bureau. Uh, on that issue, frankly, from a policing point of view and the mental health uh, resource point of view, we, 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 we need your help and, and the help of your colleagues on the city council uh, to uh, have additional uh, uh, policing uh, and additional mental health uh, resources, because clearly uh, there are uh, some small number uh, of, of people uh, who do have mental health issues need need help, uh, need need counseling, need services, uh, inpatient, uh, outpatient, uh, and, and that's not a task that the MTA can perform or is uh, uh, is is regulated or equipped to handle. So we, we, we'd implore we'd implore your help and, and assistance and that of your colleagues on those issues. And more than happy to help as much as we can. I feel that as I say it, that it, it, I think that this should be something that uh, a, a result of joint effort between the city and the state. I know that there's a number of, of health providers, uh, healthcare providers in our communities that they also get funded by the US State Department of Health. And sometimes they, they've been waiting for months to be disbursement, to get the disbursement of the services that they are providing, I feel that definitely, you know, we need to declare an epidemic when it came to the reality of the numbers of uh, New Yorkers, so people that they come from other states uh, and immediately they are in our streets and they need the mental health services in order to, you know, deal with, with the uh, challenges in their life. So I agree with you, we should definitely, as I said before, a call, and that's my call today on City Hall, that piece on the three on one and, and not responding immediately to a train station when someone in hope is something that is unacceptable. And I hope that they correct it as we are speaking right now. And when it comes to advocating for more resources from the city and the state, this is something that definitely as we have joined forces in all the occasion with you guys, you can come with us soon. Uh, my, my other question is about, and again, this is about how you explain that the closure of the train from one to five is something that you have heard. I mean, you mean the institution uh, from the writers, uh, how they feel and, and, and any polls that have been done or survey has also allowed us to understand that most, I don't know if it's New Yorkers or writer, support for the MTA to have the train close from one to five in order to the same first the station. Can you explain to us what is the mechanism that you have used to get the people feedback? And, and, and it's a survey, it's a poll, who has done it? And, you know, so that we can, you know, share that information. Uh, so, uh, absolutely, Chairman. Uh, so we, we regularly survey our, our customers and let, let me tell you what the results of that is with respect to the 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. closure and the, uh, and the disinfecting. Uh, about three of every four customers, actually slightly higher, uh, 76 percent, uh, strongly agree that cleaning and disinfecting efforts make them feel safe when using transit. And, and obviously, Chairman, we all want people to return to the subways, to return to Midtown Manhattan, to return to all, uh, all five boroughs. Uh, nearly three in four customers uh, tell us that trains are cleaner since the May 6th implementation of the late night system closure. 
uh, compared to only 4% who say to, to, to the contrary. So in, in both of those, the, uh, and, and those surveys were done in all of the Title VI languages, including, uh, including English and Spanish uh, and, and, and others. So overwhelmingly, overwhelming support from our customers. Uh, it may not be reflected in Twitter, but the uh, real life customers, the real life constituents chairman that you have and each of your, each of your colleagues has, uh, wants a safe and secure environment uh, on, on, the, on the subways. They're horrified by the events that they've read about in the, in, in the newspapers and, and, and the reports by the police of slashing uh, and people being pushed into uh, the tracks by, by people who are suffering presumably from uh, mental illness. Uh, and they support the approach uh, we're taking. And I, I believe, Chairman, that it's that level of confidence in the disinfecting of the stations, the platforms, the Long Island Railroad, Metro North, buses, paratransit, that is going to play a big role in New Yorkers and, and out-of-towners returning to New York City and returning to the, uh, to the mass transit system. I, I agree with you that, you know, that uh, the safety of the stations on all aspects, including people knowing that it is safe uh, to use the station that the station, the buses and the train is important. And I can tell you as someone that be using the trains as I've also been even putting the social media encouraging people to continue riding the buses and the train. One thing that I know that we can agree is that we have to pay the riders because based on my experience, I can say the vast majority of riders using the train and the buses, they are wearing the mask. It is a real occasion where we don't see, you know, someone in the bus in the train that they are not using the mask. And I think that a lot has to do with the campaign, educational campaign, the great effort that your team also been putting in place. All the stakeholders, public, private, academic, a whole a, a institution on board. So I do believe that, you know, it definitely mask save life. And I think that beside that, uh, cleaning the train, the buses is important. Of course, as I said that for me, this is about you know reopening as soon as possible, but not recognizing the great job that you're doing it. And I know that if tomorrow there's a call from the governor who say, guy, we need to put a plan in place to reopen 24 seven. I know that you are the men and women power to say, we can do it. So I know that you know you are in the position leading this big institution, a one trillion dollar value institution. But a lot also has to do with what the state decide on things that we should do, and that's what I also know. Asking you to continue doing the best you can, but I also asking the governor to please work with us so that we can reopen the train station as soon as possible. You know, now vaccine will be provided through all the five boroughs, 24 seven. A lot of those people, they don't have a car. And a lot of people, they work up to one in the morning, two in the morning. So for me, more than putting in the spot, I just want to make the case that as we are ready to work hard and 21 should be the year that we should say we are back in our feet as a city, as a Northeast, we definitely should plan and work together to put the resources that you need including the men and women power to clean the resource and everything to get the station, you know, safer from COVID. So, and, and, and that's my, you know, approach and my, and my argument with this case. So Chairman, I, I think we agree on much. Uh, two points I, I want to make. One is that we are eagerly looking forward to the day that uh, uh, we return 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. service. Uh, we're looking to the day when uh, most people, everybody uh, is vaccinated and we have crowding on the Lexington Avenue line and that, that, that is going to be a happy day. The, the other thing I want to say is, and this is important, your anecdotal experience about your rides on the subways and buses where you see almost universal mass compliance, that, that, that's also my anecdotal experience, but more importantly, the data suggests that. The regular surveys that we do of mass compliance on subways, buses, Metro North, and Long Island Railroad all indicates that it is above 95%. Uh, 
and all the public health officials agree that the single most important thing that uh, any of us can do individually is to wear a mask. It protects the wearer, it protects fellow commuters, and it protects our employees. Uh, and I, I'm uh, uh, gratified, Chairman, that your anecdotal experience is the same as mine, and it's more importantly backed up by the data. So thank you for that. Thank you. Chairman, how many, and, and of course, I'd like to thank also the members, the leadership of the ATU and TW also who are in our hearing today, and they represent a great many women that keep the train running. How many uh, uh, workers died uh, because of COVID so far? Well, uh, sadly, 142. Okay, thank you. And my last question with this, and then I'm calling my council member Levin who joined us. He also have a few questions. Uh, uh, who are, uh, are you using public, uh, private contractor to clean the stations or, or, or you are only doing with the in, inside a, a MTA employee? Chairman, it's, it's being primarily done by MTA forces, but there is a uh, there are some private contractors that are doing the work. Okay, and with that one, I will be following up with your team. A, a one area where I feel that we still can do better, which is to get opportunity for more women and minority, especially those from our city, to also be part of those who get opportunity to do contract with the women and minority, as you know. It, MTA is a big institution and it is more easy to blame the leadership, to blame people in government, but the private sector, they're making billions of dollars every day as a result of the larger institution, transportation institution that we have here. And, and one of the things that everyone knows is that, you know, when we build those trains, we know many of those infrastructure, the elevators, you know, it benefits the economy of many states in the South, in the Midwest. So I feel also that at some point, we also, I would like to look at the micromanagement when it comes to, when we look at women and minority, and of course, we all always share that we make making the number, what percentage of those are New York City a, a residents who are participating and taking advantage of the big opportunity for, in, on women and minority. And I want to happen again to follow with you team I'm more focusing and concerned on how to work with you, how to connect it in those sectors that they are in a five worlds to the person that you have in charge to oversee the women and minority so that we can continue expanding those opportunities. So Chairman, uh, br briefly, we, we are unbelievably proud of what we've done in the FWB and DBE space. And, and let me just, a couple of facts. One is co COVID, COVID spent, as you know, Governor Cuomo's goal is 30% uh, MWBE, DBE. On COVID spending, uh, we have 32% of the COVID spending has been purchased from New York State MWBEs and DBEs. So that's in the period from uh, March uh, to uh, the, the, end of, uh, the end of 2020. Uh, about 70, nearly $80 million uh, on uh, general uh, MWBE uh, spending in 2020, uh, the MTA uh, spent $772 million, uh, almost $800 million. That's over 27% uh, of our New York state funded projects. As you know, Chairman, different rules apply to federally funded uh, projects. Uh, and the MTA, I'm proud to say, is itself responsible for fully 25% of all MWBE payments statewide. Uh, be happy to follow up with you, but we're, we're incredibly proud of the COVID spending and just the spending uh, and, and this effort, uh, as I'm sure you know, led by Michael Gardner, uh, who has done a fantastic job on these issues. Yeah, and look, more than happy to follow with you. As you know, everything is local. And, and I can tell you that I don't know one person in my district a, 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 that I represent that, that, you know, they, and I can tell you that I, I have a good, I need grassroots organizer. So I connect a lot with my small business community. So I don't know one person that they can say, you know, we have the opportunity to be part of the women and minority led by the MTA. I know that that's the experience of many of my 51 colleagues at the council. And, and I also believe that, you know, that doesn't happen only on the MTA. 
that happen on construction in many area. A lot of people who are outside the five world, you know, they can be from Long Island, they can be from upstate New York, that they are doing well, you know, in this field. And I just want to see how under your leadership, we look at the five world, you know, city, how we can still look at more opportunity to connect more women in minority, especially on the third community, to have opportunity to be part of the big economy that, you know, MTA represents. So, so Chairman, to that issue, Michael Gardner and his team regularly run job fairs. Uh, the job fairs obviously uh, at this time are, are, are virtual. Uh, and, and given the spending, the $772 million that was spent on New York State funded projects, 27% of the uh, uh, spending, uh, it, it undoubtedly has to positively affect constituents in your, uh, in your district. And I'll, I'll ask Michael to do some uh, follow up on that. Yeah. And again, I, I had a great conversation with you, team, and this is something that we do agree that we can follow. So I do appreciate it. But I want to, you know, highlight it that this is something that, as you say, you know, when we look at the state level, and this is like a state institution, you know, sometimes there's other sectors you know, outside in New York City that they are doing much better. It could be because they know how to navigate information, because they know how the system works, because they have a network. So I just believe that this is one of those areas that I hold down under your leadership. You also leave your fingerprint to look at underserved community that they also have a large numbers of women and minority and how they can also be part of, of, of that opportunity. Be, uh, Chairman, ha be, ha be happy to follow up with you, but uh, given the numbers that uh, I, you know, we, I, I just cited, the MTA's performance is something for us to be proud of. Uh, be happy to work with you to uh, uh, get out the word to a greater extent in your district. Thank you, Chair. Let me call now on Council Member Levin to have your question, and then we will move to the public section. Time begins now. Council Member Levin, do we have you? Okay, Chair, it looks like we don't have Council Member Levin. Okay. Eh, gracias al Chairman de la MTA, Pafoy, por estar con nosotros hoy. Estuvimos con él una conversación sobre la importancia de reabrir los trenes en la madrugada, la importancia de que todos apoyemos a la MTA, de que tenga los fondos necesarios del de gobierno federal para tener la finanza. Y estamos también esperando de que juntos podamos crear oportunidades para que la compañía de minoría también puedan tener contrato con la MTA. Vamos a seguir corriendo la MTA segura, eficiente, y todo asegurando de que ellos tengan el apoyo necesario. Thank you, Chair, for your great leadership, and we will continue working with you and your team. With that, and Chairman, thank, you. To the thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, we will now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given two minutes to speak. Please begin once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist uh, should use the Zoom raised hand function and I'll call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. Um, Chair, it looks like we have council member 11 now, if we still have the MTA. You can check if they're there and if, uh... If they are, of course, and if not, then we just need to continue to the public, but I, I leave it on you to check. Thank you, Chair. Sorry about that. I, I had to uh, step off screen for a minute. Yeah, Council Member, we're checking to see the, if the chair is still there because uh, before you join, rejoining, uh, he already stepped out. Okay. Um, Elio, can you check? Sure. Could Bear with us one moment, Councilor. Thank
Chair, it looks like we might have lost uh, Chairman Foy for the time. Um, we can still go to Councilmember Levin for, for his remarks, but we may not be able to ask the chairman any questions. Okay. Great. Councilmember Levin, if you, uh, as you heard, they already step out. Uh, I do appreciate all the time that they uh, they gave to this hearing, but I really apologize for, no, for you not to be able to ask a question, but if you have anything to say, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I mean, I just, I, I, I wanted to ask the MTA um, what um, scientific studies they're relying upon um, to, um, uh, to guide their policy on, on, on um, cleaning the, the, the stations and the cars every night. I, I don't know if there's, I mean, they, they came up with that policy um, in the early days of the pandemic when we knew uh, much less about the nature of the spread of COVID. Um, I think we know a lot more now. And I just, I just don't know if, if they've, what, what studies they're relying upon uh, and whether, the, whether it's necessary at this point or whether people are getting sick by, um, or whether, whether, the, whether the current uh, actions that they're taking are, um, are keeping people from getting sick. Um, that's it's so I, I just I don't know if they've you know this is now a, a policy that's going on almost a year and what's it based on I mean that, that's not that's one question um, I I would like for them to um, uh, supply us with any anecdotal I mean any any um, any data not anecdotal data but we have we have seen it, uh, an increase anecdotally of um, of kind of random um, violent crime on the subway, so the slashings and 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 the people being pushed onto the tracks, we see them reported in the newspaper. Um, I would like to see from the MTA um, uh, some type of objective data to show us whether that is. Um, whether that's really an uptick that we're seeing or whether it's uh, and how they would um, analyze that and, um, and, and, and the like. Um, uh, and then um, I, I would like to know the status of, they had announced uh, probably 18 months ago now that they were um, adding um, uh, MTA police officers and so not NYPD transit officers, but a, uh, MTA police officers to um, uh, to the subway system. I don't know the status on that. Um, and so those are all those are all kind of big picture questions that I would um, you know I would like to have some some answers on. Um, if anybody, I realize that Chair Foy is not is not is no longer on the call, but if there's anybody from the MTA that can answer those questions that's still on the call, I would, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, if they are, I will let, I will let him uh, jump in, but if not, a uh, council member, I will have to continue moving into the public sanction now. Uh, by the MTA, by any time, would like to uh, join in the governmental relation, more than happy to do that. Uh, uh, Elio, let's continue the public and let the MTA, again, I know that they testify, we led by the chair, but if at any opportunity, the government regulation want to say anything, they're more than happy to do it, but we have to continue now going to the public. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we can also follow up with questions for the MTA following the hearing. Um, again, we will now turn to public testimony. Um, as I said, each panelist will receive two minutes to speak, uh, and please wait to begin until the sergeant has started the timer. Um, council members who have questions for panelists use the raise hand function in Zoom and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. 
Uh, for panelists, once your name is called, a member of the staff will unmute you and the sergeant will give you the go ahead to begin upon setting the timer. Um, I would now like to welcome our first panelist to testify. Uh, that will be Alfeca Matardi. And I, I apologize for pronunciation of names. Time begins now. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman and all of the uh, Committee on Transportation for having me. My name is Alfeca Mutardi. I am a macroeconomist with the Coalition for a National Infrastructure Bank. And I realize today that you're here to meet on uh, the, the MTA and ways that it can enhance its service during this COVID period. But I'd like to step back and talk about the overall picture of the finances of the city of New York and in particular financing transportation and introduce you to a bill in Congress. It's called HR 6422 and it calls for the creation of a national infrastructure bank to finance infrastructure all across America. And that includes in the wonderful great state of New York and city of New York. So uh, what this bill will do will be uh, to create a- I'm sorry, let me, it, you will be able to have five minutes I will give you that, that time. So instead of two, go to five, since you also know representing numbers of members and since you are speaking on behalf of all of them. So uh, let's, let's use five minutes. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. So this bank uh, would create uh, a, a, a bank, a public bank that is that will that will lend for for infrastructure across America, $4 trillion to cover uh, everything. That is not, thank you, that is not uh, currently financed by uh, the uh, federal government or state and local governments, all of the financing gap. And then in addition to that, for roads, bridges, rail, airports, uh, water uh, infrastructure, and then in addition to that, this bill will also cover uh, high-speed rail, affordable housing, uh, broadband access to underserved areas, and other large mega projects. The beauty of the bank is that we'll, it will complete and complement all of the current needs of the MTA to uh, finance the, all the capital projects that have been put on hold that will include, for example, the Second Avenue subway and the extension of all the other lines and stations. Uh, it will include other infrastructure projects that impact the MTA like the gateway project, uh, gateway tunnel project that, that brings uh, commuters in from uh, uh, north and south areas and is uh, currently in, uh, has a real safety danger problem. Uh, the, this this uh, financing will create up to 25 million new great paying jobs. In the city of New York, uh, it'll create up to uh, 1.6 million great paying jobs and will finance all of the projects that are not receiving funding now. Um, the, your, your discussion on MTA has focused a lot on going to the federal government to ask for financial resources to bridge you over this COVID gap. And I would like to tell the council members that I have really looked carefully at the federal budget and the new administration who has come in with a lot of really strong, bold plans for building out rail, for, uh, for supporting uh, public transit, for doing all kinds of transportation and other projects. But the big problem will be funding these projects. So what this bank will do will be to lift the responsibility for financing all of the unmet gap onto the infrastructure bank and take it off of federal finances and state and local finances. Without this bank, probably you will not be able to get a lot of the projects uh, done that you have on your capital project plan right now. Your, your plan right now is for $51 billion, as Chairman Foy has said. Uh, the, um, that does not include a lot of projects that are not funded, like Gateway and like, I think, uh, the Second Avenue subway. So this, this will bridge you over. In addition, this bank will be doing inner city and community development. It will be building affordable housing. It will be providing you with new uh, infrastructure and projects that you hadn't had before to take care of your homelessness and mental illness problems. Another huge segment of your local minority that you haven't really talked about during this hearing are all the folks who lost their jobs 
during the COVID period who will not be able to find new employment afterwards, who are living in homeless shelters or who have a uh, long-term rent that's due and they will not be able to pay back. And eventually when all the limitations expire, they may become homeless themselves. It'll be a whole new gr uh, group of folks. And then in addition, we really need to get to these transportation deserts that were spoken of. We need to get rail projects out to these places that don't have them now that are not on the current capital plan for transportation. This bank can cover all of those things. However, the bank won't get passed and enacted by itself without your strong support. So we're asking for you, council members, to support um, House Resolution uh, 14322, 1432, pardon me, which has been introduced by um, uh, uh, Council Member Rodriguez and Lander and others, you will have just gotten a letter of introduction about this uh, uh, resolution. What it does is memorializes Congress, your members of Congress, to pass uh, 6422 to create a national infrastructure bank. And by having all this grassroots support from every single jurisdiction that has huge infrastructure needs, we can get this bank moving forward and to fill out all of the infrastructure needs and build out our country be better back best uh, in ways that uh, the, the current vision uh, envisions with the Biden administration and Secretary Buttigieg, but, w but there are not funds to cover all of these infrastructure needs. So we ask for your support to cover, uh, to support and co-sponsor co uh, House Resolution 14322 to support the National Infrastructure Bank. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, and yes, on, on correction, the bill, the resolution that we have at the council the lead price are, I want to mention a name that also uh, you didn't mention it, which is about council member Robert Conigan and, and myself, and of course, working with council member Bragland and other, but uh, I would like to thank uh, council member Robert Conigan for being the person who also started with this in the, in the, in ideas on how to put his resolution, and he gave me the opportunity to be a co prime together with him. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do any other council members have questions for this panelist? Okay, seeing none, uh, next we will hear from Stanley Forsek. Stanley. Time begins now. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, and good afternoon, everyone. I really appreciate the time that uh, you've given us here today. I am also with the uh, Coalition for National Infrastructure Bank. I'm a retired executive from Amtrak. I spent over 30 years there. And I just would like to embellish a little bit of what my colleague has said uh, regarding uh, the National Infrastructure Bill legislation that's in front of Congress. The issue here is very simple and, and you heard it from uh, the chairman and his team from the MTA and that is they have a very aggressive capital plan. But one of the issues as, as Alfeca has just mentioned is there is not a lot of money to be appropriated for transportation and other infrastructure projects. The time uh, is now to go through and establish a new national infrastructure bank. This would be the fourth national infrastructure bank in the history of the United States. It was created first by Alexander Hamilton, and there have been three after that. These banks built all of the infrastructure that we have in the country. Right now, our infrastructure, and you're well aware of it in New York because your subway system is over 120 years old, but there are railroads in the West that have roadbeds that are over 200 years old. So the issue is our infrastructure is falling apart and the only way to do it is to use a national infrastructure bank to get everything done. Because if we're gonna wait for appropriations, it's not gonna be done. It's not gonna be done by a suggested year of 2024, it might work all the way up into the 40s and 50s of this century. So I urge you to follow the lead of your uh, chairman and sign on to the new resolution that's out there to support the legislation that we've got. So I, I think it's time that we really think about these things and get things done. Last issue, safety issue. I'm, I'm sorry, thank you. Thank you. 
Okay. Uh, think, do, do any other council members have questions for this panelist? Okay. Uh, seeing none, our next panelist will be Jose de Jesus. Jose? I, I'm sorry, Elio. Are we calling? Sorry. Do we have it, the TW or the ATU? Yes. Uh, let's be sure that we call them and then we follow with the rest of the public. Yes. Well, oh, I'm sorry. Did you see the question? You may begin, sir. Okay, my, my main concern is basically I understand the NCA is looking at the budget plans and where they are situated. But I do have, I mean, Councilman Miller brought it up that I have membership that are doing the same job as CW100 and putting their job, their, their lives and their families on the line, and they're not getting paid the same wages. As for the PPE, they made a much better drive towards that. They, they make it much more regular and much more available for our members. But it's, it's, just, it's just the fact that they, they seem to have data about the wider right public. Your, your sound have, is a little muffled. Can, is there any way that you could improve the sound a bit? I'm Thank sorry. You. How's this? Is that a little bit better? I'm still better. The technology. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I got a bus operator sorted this past weekend and sat on because he asks his customer to wear a mask. And the thing about it is, is just for the safety of the operator, because now this is, they don't have the, they're not having the six feet distancing that they were doing before between the operators and the public. It is just trying to keep us safe and the other, the other, other riders. And I, I understand they're saying that they, the, the numbers are looking high and looking well, but the, the fact of the matter is in the, in the communities that we serve, that, my, that I serve, is the, the mandate saying it doesn't work. And then we get the tendency the bus operators tend to look out the other way because they don't want no they don't want no problems, no hassles and stuff like that. And I understand there's, there's no way they could guarantee this, but they could make it easier for us to contact them and make it safe for our operators instead of just saying keep driving the bus. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, do many council members have questions for this panelist? Okay, our next panelist will be Mark Henry. Mark. Time begins now. Thank you, Chairman Rodriguez for this invitation and good day to your colleagues on the city council. Uh, my name is Mark Henry. I'm the president and business agent for Local 1056 and I also chair our state conference board. A uh, special thank you to uh, Speaker Johnson for his acknowledgments today of uh, transit workers this morning and Chairman Foy and President Feinberg for their acknowledgement of our losses to our rank and file members throughout the MTA system. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't say thank you to Senator Chuck Schumer who delivered for this agency and receiving funding, funding it needed to keep the agency going. Uh, I always appreciate this opportunity to tell you the plight of our members. Uh, we have endured a lot uh, from day one uh, back in March. Uh, we have we were the individuals who were not be, not able to shelter in place. We are those individuals who had problems getting PPE, excuse me, PPE in the very beginning, uh, even though the agency has improved on that. Um, getting us to our PPE and getting us COVID testing has been a great help to our members. The anxiety levels that our workforce uh, and, and membership have gone through continue to be great. Uh, the vaccine, as far as us receiving it, I mean, we, we have a very small window of opportunity. It's, it's been an anxiety issue for our members to get vaccinated, uh, to, to be able to work and, and provide the services we do for the, for the, for the agency. Uh, the homelessness on the buses has been an issue. Uh, the anxiety of being laid off, which is something that the, the chairman didn't mention, but that was something that has been out there and is a specter that hangs over the membership's head. Uh, we're classified as essential. You know, we, we move essential workers throughout the city. And unfortunately, we are without a contract at this time. Uh, TWU has a contract in the ATU not only my local, but the other ATU locals uh, that, that represent and, and move people throughout the five boroughs are without a contract. Like I stated earlier, Senator Schumer has delivered funding for this agency, but yet we still 
to this day have been without a contract for almost two years. Uh, our members have put their lives at risk, put their families at risk, um, they're deserving of hazard pay. If that is, it, it should be included in this, we, we're equally deserving. Our dedication and hard work should be recognized and never marginalized. You know, and cuts to bus service, which is something that we've seen and, and starting to notice, uh, having talks with the agency in regards to that needs to be uh, shelved. Uh, anytime you try to cut any type of transportation service in the city, it, it, it kills the neighborhood. It kills the, the city of New York from progressing and moving back into a prosperous uh, environment for businesses to flourish, uh, neighborhoods to flourish. So we, we definitely see that That's as fine. thanks. And we just make sure that the, 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 the overcrowding on buses does not occur. Again, I'm always here as a resource and thank you again for your time, Chairman uh, Rodriguez. Thank you. Thank you. Do any council members have questions for this panelist? Okay, uh, seeing none, our next panelist will be Lisa Daglian. Lisa. Time begins I, you, I'm sorry, I'll be right there. Let me just get my testimony in front of me. Uh, greetings. My name is Lisa Dagley, and I'm the Executive Director of the Permanent Citizens Advisory Committee to the MTA, PCAC. Thank you for holding this hearing today. We'd like to first acknowledge the transit workers who have kept the system running throughout the pandemic and thank them for their continued service. We also recognize and mourn those whose lives were lost. It's hard to believe that we were thrust into the vast unknown of COVID-19 a year ago. During this time, the MTA kept service running to allow essential workers to get where they needed to go so the rest of us could stay home. They've undertaken initiatives and implemented protocols, some more successful than others, to keep us safe. The MTA's fiscal resources have been devastated as a result. More federal funding is critical to emerging from the crisis, as is restarting the capital program. The city's $3 billion is sorely needed sooner than later to help kickstart it. Congestion pricing and the money it brings will hopefully pick it up from there. Ridership continues to be low, even with the vaccine rollout. In January, we released a white paper entitled How the MTA Can Transition into the New Normal, Getting Riders Back on Board, which includes our recommendations on measures the MTA should take to increase rider confidence and get them back on transit. It will require money. Additional funding is essential to move the needle on these best practices. We've learned a lot in the past year, including how COVID-19 has spread and the best ways to contain it. Accepted theory in May, in May no longer holds true today though. Subways are still closed tonight, overnight to regular riders, ostensibly to clean and disinfect the system, but trains are still running. And science tells us that's not the most effective way to stop the spread. It's time to restore 24 seven service. Tens of thousands are forced to find other ways to get to work or back home, or to get vaccines between 1 and 5 a.m. From the start, we've been asking for metrics and milestones to determine, uh, to help guide when the system can reopen. We've heard nothing, as, as have you. And while we're big supporters of the bus network, it is not a substitute for the subways. If people can go to football games and dine in restaurants and soon attend New York pop -up, Pops Up events, they can certainly ride the subways overnight. Caring for the homeless means providing lasting shelter and services and the two should be seen as the separate issues they are. We all look forward to restarting the economy and getting on with life. 24 seven subway service is an integral part of what will help us get there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, do any council members have questions for this panelist? Okay, seeing none, uh, next we will call on Colin Wright. Colin? Time begins now. Hi, good morning, I'm Colin Wright. I'd like to thank uh, Chair Rodriguez and the Committee on Transportation for the opportunity to testify today. Um, as New York City continues to navigate its recovery from this pandemic, it's critical that city leaders do so with the promise of equity and justice for those in our city who have been hardest hit. We can't let these riders continue to be marginalized by policy that fails to interrogate harmful and disproportionate impacts. 
This year, the city can prioritize those riders. First, we ask for your continued support in demanding that Governor Cuomo restore 24 hour service. Uh, we appreciated the letter signed by uh, Council Member Rodriguez and, and his uh, colleagues in January, which argued that the overnight subway closure is impeding 24 hour COVID vaccine distribution and should be ended. Governor Cuomo's decision to close the subway each night has stranded over 50,000 of your subway riding constituents by making it nearly impossible for them to reach their overnight shifts at airports, hospitals, bodegas, and construction sites. Uh, the vast majority are non-white and 32% are of low incomes, according to census data compiled by my organization. The governor's stated reason for the closure to disinfect subway cars during the week is not backed by the latest scientific evidence. In January, the leading scientific journal Nature summed up the science on COVID transmission in an article with the headline, COVID-19 rarely spreads through surfaces, so why are we still deep cleaning? The article specifically called out the MTA's vast expenditure of resources during overnight cleaning as an example of what not to do. Contrary to what we initially thought, the risk of transmitting COVID on transit may well be low, particularly if riders wear masks. While the MTA attempts to regain confidence of riders with stringent cleaning, it appears universal mask wearing and proper ventilation is what keeps the virus at bay. Second, we ask individual council members to support the Zoning for Transit Accessibility proposal sponsored by the New York City Council, Department of City Planning, Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities, uh, and the MTA. And I'm running out of time, so I'll just say uh, this policy is supported by organizations representing New Yorkers with disabilities, uh, New Yorkers with children, older New Yorkers. It's a, it's a good policy and it'll streamline and accelerate progress toward a fully accessible subway system. Um, so I'll just wrap up by saying this is a pivotal time for New York City's future. We really must use this year to put the city in the best possible position to recover from the pandemic. A fair recovery for New York City will require making transit riders a priority. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Uh, do any council members have questions for this panelist? Okay, our next panelist we will hear from is Eric McClure. Eric? Time begins now. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Rodriguez, uh, for the opportunity to testify today. Um, like my colleagues and others today, I would like to honor those uh, frontline workers with the MTA who've kept New York City moving for the past 11 months and to remember those whose lives were lost to the virus. New York City's transit system is the engine that has driven our economy for more than 100 years. And it's never been more important than it will be in rebuilding our economy as we recover from COVID-19. As the pandemic gripped New York last spring, subway ridership plummeted by 90%, and it remains lower by 70%. Buses, which actually ran on time with fewer cars on the streets and no fare collection for a period last year, are at just 50% of normal ridership. Yet automobile traffic is back to nearly pre-pandemic levels. However, a car leg recovery is completely unsustainable and anathema to the cleaner, greener future New York can only achieve with robust transit ridership. To get New Yorkers back on transit, the MTA must restore 24-7 subway service. There is scant evidence that subways and buses have been a vector for the spread of COVID-19, nor that fomite transmission is a significant factor. But shutting down the subways for overnight cleaning sends the public a message that they're some, somehow unsafe. Sufficient cleaning can be accomplished while running subways around the clock, which is what's happening anyway since trains continue to run without passengers between 1 a.m. and 5 a.m. Yet tens of thousands of New Yorkers, overwhelmingly frontline workers, people of color, and residents of lower income communities are severely inconvenienced by the overnight shutdown. Enhanced bus service is a very poor substitute, especially when you're trying to get to or from work at three in the morning or to a COVID vaccination site, which are open throughout the night, even while subways are not. We urge the council to demand that the MTA immediately publish the metrics and timeline it will use to evaluate resumption of 24 seven subway service without any further delay. They've done that for restaurants, gyms, and schools, and must do the same for the most essential piece of our transportation network. The city that never sleeps can't recover without a full recovery of our subway system, and the subways can't recover without a return to 24-7 service. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do any council members have questions for this panelists? Okay, seeing none, our next panelist will be Leo Aspen. Leo? Time begins now. Um, good afternoon, uh, Chair Rodriguez and members of the committee. My name is Leo Eason. I'm a volunteer and president of AARP New York, 
<clears throat> which has 750,000 members of the 50 plus community in New York City. AARP would also like to thank all of the MTA employees for their incredible work and tireless efforts throughout the pandemic and acknowledge the loss of the 142 MTA employees as a result of the COVID crisis. The MTA is the lifeblood of New York City and critical for the lives of the 50 plus New Yorkers. Um, however, there are issues uh, as, as have been discussed. Many stations are ADA inaccessible and there are transit deserts in many of the outer boroughs. The MTA has made strides to improve these uh, issues, but the um, COVID pandemic has decimated their capital budget. AARP calls on the MTA to commit to the following measures to support mass transit and the 50 plus community. Continue avoiding any service cuts to balance the budget, especially bus services. When funds return to the capital budget, prioritize ADA and station accessibility projects. Continue delaying the biennial fare hikes until the end of the COVID-19 pandemic and ensure that any new technology implemented such as the fare payment systems or journey planning applications is accessible for older adults and people with disabilities. And finally, AARP calls on the city to commit to preserving the full funding for the fair fares program in the fiscal year 22 budget. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do any council members have questions for this panelist? Okay, our next panelist will be HP Schroer. HP. Time begins. Trying to unmute. Oh, my name is HP Schroer, a veteran of World War II and director of You MeWe, a veterans advocacy organization that represents 12,000 veterans attending college in New York City. Almost five years ago, the mayor and the city council and Corey Johnson approved veterans attending college in the city were to be able to purchase MTA fares at half price. The only requirements were they had to be honorably discharged and attend colleges in the city. Their income was not to be a factor in determining their eligibility. Sadly, after five years, less than 500 of the 12,000 who were able, were able to purchase discounted fares. Why? Because of income restrictions imposed by the Department of Social Services. I asked uh, Chairman Rodriguez if you could look into this. Mindful of the MTA financial difficulties, there are two pending bills in the state legislature, which are supported by a majority from both parties, which gives the MTA a veterans half fair discount. Not only do bills AO74 and bills S1287 do this, but the money can only be used for the discount and will not come from the MTA budget. I know Pat and the board fights like hell to get money for the budget. Veterans have been the country's first responders for over 250 years, and we continue to fight for you. We ask that you fight for us. While we appreciate the words, thank you for your service, it's time for the current board to ask itself, is it the right thing to do? And explain to the public why you continue to charge veterans full fare and why you haven't made any effort to ask the governor to pass the bills which give you the money to fund the discount. I thank you. Thank you, HP. Uh, do any council members have questions for this panelist? I'm more than happy to be working with you. Let's follow up and, and Elio, let's, and, and my, my team at the, um, at the committee, let's try to see if we can put any language or resolution or support 
or die stay, stay like, uh, Bill. I thank you very kindly. Thank you. Okay, our next panelist will be Tanya Cruz. Tanya? Tanya, you may begin. Do we have Tanya? Okay, we can move on to the next panelist and we can check in again with Tanya. Our, our next panelist will be Carlos Castel Croak. Carlos? Clock is ready. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Carlos Castel Croak and I am the Associate for New York City Programs at the New York League of Conservation Voters. NYLCV represents over 30,000 members in New York City, and we are committed to advancing a sustainability agenda that will make our people, our neighborhoods, and our economy healthier and more resilient. I would like to thank Chair Rodriguez, Speaker Johnson, and all of the council members here for the opportunity to testify today. New York City's extensive public transportation system is a point of pride for New Yorkers. The MTA trains and buses provide an accessible, accessible and affordable way for New York City residents tourists and local workers to get around the city without the need for personal automobiles. The MTA is particularly important to working class New Yorkers for a reliable commute to and from work. The service that the MTA provides are also critical in helping to curb pollution and fight climate change by providing cleaner mass transportation alternatives to cars. This hearing correctly focuses on MTA in the era of COVID because we all know that this past year has affected so many aspects of our daily lives, including the transportation network. While the suspension of overnight MTA service was implemented to provide a window for proper cleaning, the suspension has also been incredibly difficult on the working class, people of color, and especially our essential workers. Our transit system already underserves many of the communities where these New Yorkers reside, as transit deserts too often overlap with low-income communities of color. In a recent state budget hearing, it was even revealed that the MTA has not saved any money from the overnight suspensions. Therefore, we believe that the keeping the overnight service suspensions in place does more harm than good especially as it can continue to encourage residents who relied on public transportation for years now to instead rely on personal vehicles. In order to get more people out of dirty, dangerous and congestion inducing personal vehicles and onto public transportation, we need to improve our mass transit system. In 2019, the state authorized congestion pricing and historic first uh, that passed the way, paved the way for public transit renaissance. But that public transit renaissance and our recovery from the pandemic is conditional on using congestion pricing proceeds and other funding sources to ensure our public transit system functions at a high level of efficiency. This is particularly relevant for our bus system. Um, just to add before I, I run out of time is that we, we really think that improvements to our bus system um, with infrastructure, lane enforcement and signal improvements will really build the trust that we need um, as uh, before it, congestion pricing comes into play. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, do any council members have questions for this panelist? Okay, seeing none. Um, now I'd like to call on uh, anyone that I haven't called on who would like to testify. If you could please use the Zoom raise hand function. Okay, Chair, I think that's the end of public testimony. Thank you. I would like to thank all the sergeants and the whole team at the council for helping us to conduct the remote hearing. And also to the great team that we have at the Committee of Transportation. And also to my chief of staff, Elizabeth Conform, and my legislative director, Evelyn Collado, my communication person, Tomá Garita. All you guys great, did a, did a great job, and I appreciate also the members of the public that came here to testify. I want to highlight that as far as I know, under the new plan of Biden-Harris stimulus plan, where we had the great leadership of Senator Schumer, the New York City congressional delegations, including my colleague, Council Member Espallaco, Congressman Espallá, who also is part of the Appropriation, Com Appropriation Committee, former members of the Transportation Committee, all of them, they're working together to be sure that we get the financial support. And one other thing that I want to highlight is that based on what we know, the MTA can claim through FEMA uh, uh, all the laws that they also are getting uh, through the reduction of, of ridership, as far as I know, 
And if that will be the case, I definitely would like to reinforce my call for the MTA again, not only to continue providing the services, improving safety for riders, but also to be sure that we restore the services 24 seven as soon as possible and that we continue working in our great ambition plan, especially with the capital 2024 that will upgrade the signal system and now under the new leadership of the chief of accessibility, uh, our great New Yorkers, Q Arroyo, to work to make sure that all train station will be accessible. I see that Tanya Cruz also is there to raise a hand. So let's and then call on her and before we close this hearing. Thank you, Chair. I um I apologize for missing it. I was actually on the call with That's Councilman okay. Miller. Um, what I wanted to do is I'm with Community Board 13, and what we were getting from our constituents about the buses in Southeast Queens is that there is a derelict on the part of the ridership of wearing masks and the bus drivers are being, you know, they are trying to do their best. They are being confronted. They are being threatened and people, the homeless has camped out on our buses. We're starting to see trash. There's so much that's going on in Southeast Queens with the homelessness and people not wearing masks. So if there's anything that council can do to assist the MTA with this, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. So thank you. And, and before yeah. closing, I, I, I yeah. want to re-elaborate my thanks to all the colleagues in government, Speaker Johnson, but especially to our Brooklyn Board President that, that during the time of the pandemic, dedicating so a lot of time to go station through station, which we did most of them together, distributing masks and advocating to restore the MTS services 24 seven. With that, this hearing is adjourned.